Excellent. Welcome, everyone, to the Township of Whitewater Region's regular council meeting for Wednesday, February 1st. Um, big full agenda tonight. Lots of people here present that you'll hear from shortly um, when we get to some of our presentations. But first, we'll call the meeting to order at 446. As we gather, we would like to acknowledge on behalf of council and our community that we are meeting on the traditional territory of the Algonquin people. We would like to thank the Algonquin people and express our respect and support for their rich history. And we're extremely grateful for their many and continued displays of friendship. We also thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. Next, our next item is the prayer. If I could please have everybody stand. Almighty God, we give thanks for the great blessings which have been bestowed on Canada and its citizens including the gifts of freedom, opportunity, and peace that we enjoy. Guide us in our deliberations as township councillors and strengthen us in our awareness of our duties and responsibilities. Grant us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to preserve the blessing of this country for the benefit of all and to make good laws and wise decisions. Amen. Next item on the agenda is disclosures of interest. Going across around the table, is there any disclosures of interest tonight? Good. None seen. Item number four, our public meetings and presentations. We're going to start tonight with our first presentation is by Heather Corrigan, a resident on Gypsy Lane. Heather, as we discussed earlier, I didn't say Gypsy Lane, the topic is Gypsy Lane. Sorry, Heather. Um, we're going to just give Heather a chance to come up to the podium here. You have 10 minutes to uh, address council with your comments. And at the end, we'll see if there's any questions from the members. Yes. Just make sure. So the green button is turn the is it to turn the mic on. Press the green button to shut off. Okay. Thank you. Good. That's perfect. Thank you. Good to go. I just want to thank uh, the councillors of Whitewater for allowing me to speak today. Um, on behalf of the residents that are here uh, this afternoon, as, long, as well as many residents that couldn't make it due to other obligations. Today I'm just here to discuss uh, the ongoing issue that was brought up last week on presentation by Mrs. Gilchrist about public road gypsy lane to the access township road allowance with regards where safety and legally snowmobiles can drive. I just actually would like to thank Mrs. Gilchrist for bringing up the issue of safety and education when traveling on snowmobiles because we feel that's very important as well. As residents and homeowners in the area, we are always mindful of our speed and being respectful of our surroundings. Riding as far off the shoulder as possible, if unable to drive in the ditches on any road, doesn't matter what road, Gypsy, Springfield, Acres Road, Zion Line, or any other town we enter because snowmobiling is a privilege and we treat it as, as such. So when talking about Gypsy Lane, one of the safest roads that we feel to travel on. It's less than 300 meters with great sight lines of driveways attached as a Springfield Drive. Springfield is in the middle, almost the middle of Gypsy Lane and you have to drive cautiously um, to watch out for oncom oncoming traffic. So there's not a lot of abundance of speeding on this road from snowmobiles. Taking Gypsy Lane allows us to utilize the road allowance that connects to the B114 trail. Um, that trail can take you all over and take you to Beechburg, takes you to the B101A that connects you to Renfrew, Eganville, and so forth. I've spoken to many other snowmobilers in the area that utilize this, this allowance from B114 trail. Uh, they use it to go onto Muskrat Lake um, off of Summerfield Drive. They go ice fishing, visit local restaurants, gas stations. They all end up um, community. So this small road, it can bring a lot of economical value to the area, especially with the town of Whitewater, <laughs> promoting many new businesses that, may <clears throat> that many snowmobilers like can enjoy and visit. There's actually a great document about the economic impact of snowmobiling in Ontario. It shows millions of dollars of variable expenditures that happen in the air in Ontario for food, beverage, fuels, overnight excursions in Ontario. And on average last year, there was over $167 million spent from snowmobilers. So we're gonna go back to safety. Um, 
we really haven't heard about rolling rocks or debris falling on the town allowance road, but not saying it can't happen. So there was a recommendation last week about taking Mansell side hill, a uh, side road instead, but unfortunately this is more dangerous. If you've ever walked Mansell, you'll know that the, there are a lot of blind spots. There's hills and hidden driveways. Uh, the ditches are also undrivable, uh, leading you to drive between the shoulder of the road, same as Gypsy Lane. So from a safety perspective, Gypsy Lane is a total of 300 metres leading to the town allowance, connects to the OFSC trail. Uh, if you suggest people to travel along Forster's Falls Road and then onto Mansell Side Road for another 800 metres to access the OFSC trail, this is not a better option. It, if we're discussing safety, it's not a better option. <clears throat> so getting into the writing of Snowmobiles and the Highway Traffic Act, keeping as far away from the road as possible in the sections between the shoulder and the fence line. It's a mouthful. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, one of our res residents, Mr. Bertrand, had a discussion with an officer uh, last on Friday, the January the 20th. Officer Condro confirmed he received a call of snowmobilers traveling on a high speed on Gypsy Lane. Um, the officer felt that the call was a waste of taxpayers' dollars and stated, if there's no trail on a public road and the ditch is not suitable to drive, stay off the road as far on the shoulder, off the shoulder, close to the snowbank as possible. He also felt this was an acceptable road for snowmobiles to travel on. So with that in mind, I called MTO, called OFSC to kind of get some more information. Um, they stated to talk to OPP. So when I talking to OPP, they had the same um, information. As long as you stay off the road as far as you can, uh, OPP feels compliant, this is compliant with the Transportation Act and is common sense. So another interesting fact that the OPP officer of 20 years plus gave me is that in their knowledge they have never given or have ever seen a ticket give out for driving as far off the shoulder as possible. Um, there has been numerous calls, as, as you know, from homeowners of Gypsy Lane to the point of harassment of local snowmobilers to the police. This is costing taxpayers of Whitewater thousands of dollars for driving on a local side road, the same as any other local side road. Um, this is starting to turn out to be a, not a safety issue, but more of a feeling of ownership to, of a road issue, and that's my feeling. So let's get back to safety. Um, trying to figure out some solutions. Uh, we contacted Scott Smiglinski, president of Whitewater Snowgoers, and asked what their opinion would be if the township was open to the discussion of turning the road, excuse me, road allowance into an official OFSC trail. Snowgoers thought this was a fantastic option and would be definitely open into talking to the township if the township was open. Uh, not, not just good for snowmobilers, it would be good for the, uh, the township economically as well. There was a letter attached to, to my documents. Um, this is just a suggestion and a way of connecting the road allowance to the B114 trail, utilizing a great asset that is already available and work with the concerns of liability and safety. So just some points to mention. The road allowances are 66 feet wide. Each property has 33 feet of allowance. Current trail that the snowmobiles travel on on Gypsy Lane is 33 feet. It is owned by the side of the field, not the side of the homeowner. So when we're driving our snowmobiles, we are driving on the opposite side of the road of the homeowners, um, of their driveways and, and uh, far away from their barns. Uh, if you're going, thinking about closing the road allowance, uh, just keep in mind that it's going to end up landlocking at least one property that I know of. Uh, for what I've looked online and cannot see, there's no bylaws prohibiting whitewater region snowmobile travel. If you end up working with the OFSC and snowgoers, it would be a great asset to Whitewater and a great economical value to Cobden and would definitely help with the liability issues. Uh, one other suggestion would be posting a uh, drive slow residential area 20 kilometers on Gypsy Lane. Not that long, that's way too long. Um, but a sign for, for driving slower. Uh, for Not just for snowmobiles, but for vehicles as well, because there are some trucks that drive very fast on that road. Um, and again, snowmobiles, snowmobilers are homeowners as well, and they respect people's homes and their farms uh, because they want to respect theirs as much as, you, as they want their own respected. And one thing, again, there's always risk of road maintenance to any road from snowmobilers, tractors, or snowplows. I have personally driven on Gypsy Lane to the road allowance for many years. I don't want to tell you how many. And 
it, it's been a great, a great trail to take. Um, I'm thinking the aging population in our area is moving away and younger families are that are recreational minded are utilizing this area way more and maybe that's starting to be the issue. There's more people using it. So in closing, I just want to say thank you and we're all about safe, fun, recreational um, biking, walking, snowmobiling, ATVing. We have a great opportunity with this beautiful township road allowance to be utilized for more than just snowmobiling. So hopefully some of my ideas are helpful for you with safety. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Mrs. Corgan. If I can just get you to hold there, we'll just see if council has any questions that they want to provide. Yeah, Councillor Bell. Just a quick, I was down in Gypsy Lane the other day just to take a look at it there. Um, but is, would there be enough room uh, for the groomer to come off that, off the trail farther down? I know it crosses at Mantle Hill Road, wherever it meets from that unopened road allowance. Would the groomer be able to, uh, to groom off one side of that trail to bring it all the way out to Gypsy Lane, basically to where it crosses Forster's Falls Road or where it comes out to the asphalt there? Well, that's a fantastic question, and that would be something if you would want to discuss with Scott Smaglinski to open, because I, I can't answer that question. Sorry. Good. Thank you. Any other questions? Sure. Councillor Olmsted. Um, I'll, I'll wait until, I, there, if there's other uh, speakers that want to speak, maybe I'll hold my comments or questions till after that. I, this is the only speaker registered tonight on this topic. Okay. And uh, anybody we from the We weren't allowed audience? to register anyone else. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, one well, maybe I'll go ahead then. Yeah, now, if you're, please go ahead. If you're okay with that. Yeah. Um, so I've been contacted by uh, many people, uh, probably a lot of them in the audience, um, regarding this Gypsy Lane issue. Um, so I did some intel myself, and I, uh, so calculations, 275 meters on Gypsy Lane, 300, we'll go through 300. Uh, 300 meters actually, so if we didn't go down Gypsy Lane, it'd be 300 meters on Fortress Falls Road, and then 800 meters on Mansell Hill Road. Uh, we all know Fortress Falls Road, I think, it's, it's a fairly busy road. In fact, uh, I have a great, great vantage point to watch um, how busy a road it is. So I think it was Monday morning, maybe Tuesday morning, I'm losing track of my weeks here, but they did snow removal from Cobden. So I got to see the township trucks rolling up on Forces Falls Road. So up until about 11 o'clock, I count at least 30 trucks, 30 um, township trucks leaving Cobden carrying snow. Um, just to give you an idea that it's a, it's a really, really busy road. And I can tell you how many of them turned down. Mounsell Hill Road was, was zero. Um, so, my opinion is either, either about active transportation or not, and about safety or not. Uh, so, this has been presented as a safety issue, so um, I concur that I think Gypsy is a, is a, a, a much safer route. Um, th this issue has been in front of us for three, my three terms, now this is my third term, and it, it's been in front of us for the, for the third time or maybe more than that, but at least my third term. Um, I think it's about time it's properly dealt with. Either, either we act on it or we don't act on it. We close it or we open it. Um, my feeling is we give what 99% of the people want, and that's they, they, they truly want a harassment-free trail that is safe for them and their family. And right now, they don't have it. I see strollers walking on the side of, of uh, Forest Falls Road and it scares the life out of me. I drive a truck and I see what bikers and walkers and strollers and that, and it, it's just not a safe area. Uh, it's supposed to be a 60 kilometer hour zone. It is not. Um, I don't think I've seen many vehicles go 60 kilometers an hour there. So in, in the interest of safety, I think it's about time that this council acts on, on uh, the comments made tonight. Thank you. Good. Thanks, Councillor Bell. Councillor Trim, or not Bell, Olmsted, sorry. Uh, yes, um, I, I maybe need to be corrected on this, but I understand with respect to snowmobiles, they, it, it's blanket across the province. They're not allowed on the travel portion of the road. They can, they can be on the portion that's not traveled. When four-wheelers came along, it was the opposite. 
four-wheelers were allowed to be on the travel portion of the road unless there was a bylaw preventing it. And in many places, they did uh, an enact bylaws to prevent it. With snowmobiles, it, as I said, it was the opposite, unless a bylaw was enacted to permit it. And in many municipalities, it made sense to permit snowmobiles to be on the dri driving, driven portion of the road to access restaurants, gas stations, motels, hotels. And so if I believe, in the, and perhaps staff could check this, but I believe that um, the municipality could enact a bylaw permitting snowmobiles to be on the driven portion of the road, uh, Gypsy Lane, and it would be legal to be there. I understand that the reason they're on the, not in the ditch area or the area between the fence line and the driven portion is because they can't make a trail there because of culverts or whatever else it is. And so it is possible to have a, it be legal, but I believe, and I do stand to be corrected, that it would need to be by municipal bylaw. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Councillor Trim. Is there anyone else? Councillor Tabbert. Okay, when I asked this question two weeks ago, I was given the word yes. I asked if it was a private trail they were using. I was told yes. Nobody said anything about an unopened road allowance. As far as I know now, there is an unopened road allowance. So I'm not sure I see why the difficulty of this has not been resolved a long time ago. I mean, we've opened up an unopened road allowance at other places, so why can't we do it here? And my other concern is, um, I know, Heather, that you said that some mobilers are, are respectful, and I do agree with that, but I've also seen posts on Facebook, I'm sure you've seen them too, um, where the snowmobiles are not staying within mm -hmm. the uh, posted limits, so, or not the limits, but the, the trail. So I would wanna see that if we were to go ahead and do something like that, I'd like to see it heavily signed because there is property there. Um, and I know you Definitely. can't control, you know, the and one Connie, or two it's or the same thing with vehicles, same with trucks, the same with the tractors, same yeah. thing with everything. Like, uh, I live just off of the road, so we, my husband and I, can see um, how many snowmobilers are driving through and, and fast. And of course, I'm not going to say every single person is 100% respectful. We can't say that, right? So, just in the lot of time I had, I'm really glad you asked this because now I can say that. Um, Definitely, there are some people that drive too fast, just like in a vehicle as well. So if we could sign it, that'd be fantastic. Oh, yeah. I'm not talking about speeding. I'm talking oh. about going onto the farmer's field so, to ignore the trail itself. So they're all fenced onto the road allowance there? Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's all but fenced. Oh, but the trails aren't fenced though. They're just, no, they just no, but it, but it is basically in. a road allowance with trees on both sides and fences on both sides. So there oh. wouldn't be able to, to come, come oh, okay. off. Okay, okay. Yeah. So it wouldn't be a whole new trail that you'd have to put in there. I guess that's, that's right. No, there, there has to be work, definitely. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, okay. Thank you very much. Good. Last, Councillor Moore. Um, I'm with Councillor Olmstead. I think it's time we uh, investigate this to the best of our ability and make sure everything's legal and then proceed. Perfect. Any other questions? There hasn't been very many questions for Ms. Corrigan, but any other questions for Mrs. Corrigan? Excellent. The only thing I did want to say to Mr. Bell was, and I could be totally wrong here, is that um, I was thinking about the groomer. Uh, the snowplow drives up to that end and they turn around and come back. So I can't see a groomer being much larger. Good. Good. That's good. Thank, Thank you very you. much, everybody. Thank you so much. <clears throat> So just uh, in terms of direction to staff, based on the feedback I've received around the table tonight and, uh, and from the members of the community tonight, as well as at the last delegation, at the last meeting, um, I'm gonna ask staff to please coordinate with the OPP and OFSC, Scott, to, uh, um, 
in addition to implementing any educational measures that are appropriate so that this trail can be available and made use for snowmobilers as well as the residents on the traffic on the on the road okay so if there are issues with that you know councillors trims questions bring them back to council if it's something that can be executed at your level make it happen excellent thank you for right now what we'll do is we'll pause shortly because i believe that most of the people in attendance would like to just step up and leave the the, the video is going to stay live but we're going to mute your mic okay so we'll give you just a couple minutes to exit the room and then we'll carry on Okay, folks, we'll, uh, now that we've had the room clear from our people that were here to do the public delegation, uh, we'll move on to our next agenda item, 4.2. Uh, we're going to have JP2G Consultants and Whitewater and Wildland Tours Limited um, uh, do a, a quick presentation. I've got a recommendation, uh, just remind me, is the recommendation come at the end or the before this one? Oh, we can do it do now okay so we're going to bring it to the table with this recommendation that council support the official plan amendment number 39 for the property described as part of lots 12 and 13 ross concession 12 to redesignate the lands from waterfront exception 40 waterfront exception 5 to permit the creation of an additional eight new lots and one retained lot through the consent process can i get a mover and a seconder please moved by councillor trim second by councillor tabbert uh, you have a script. All those in favor? Excellent. So our recommendation is accepted. Uh, I'll move into the public meeting portion, right? I'm going to start my start here. So this public meeting is for the official plan amendment to the property described as parts of lot 12 and 13, Roche concession 12. Will staff please give an overview of the application? Yeah, certainly. So what I'll do before I do that, I'll just read through a quick statement with respect to the, uh, the Ontario Planning Act and, and the rights of proponents to appeal. Uh, so if any person or public body does not make an oral submission at the public meeting, which is today, this is the public meeting uh, for the official plan amendment uh, to the County of Renfrew official plan. When official plan amendments are filed at the county level, the county hosts the public meetings in the local municipalities uh, for any input from the public. Um, so if any person or public body does not make an oral submission at the public meeting or make written submissions to the Township of Whitewater Region or the County of Renfrew before the bylaw is passed, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of, of the Council of the County of Renfrew to the Ontario Land Tribunal. The person or public body may not be added as a party to the hearing of an appeal before the tribunal unless in the opinion of the tribunal there are reasonable grounds to do so. Under section, uh, under the Planning Act, if council decides, decides to refuse an application or refuses or neglects to make a decision on an application within the prescribed time frame, the municipal clerk, uh, Rather, within this prescribed time frame, the applicant or the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing may appeal to the tribunal by filing an appeal with the clerk of the county. Under, section, under the Planning Act, it states that not later than 20 days after giving notice of the passing of the bylaw, the applicant, any person or public body who made oral submission at the public meeting uh, or made written submission to council before the bylaw was passed, or the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing may appeal the decision, or may appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal by filing an appeal with the clerk of the, of the county in this case. And uh, if you will, uh, through you, Mayor, I'll just go ahead and make presentation on the report. Yeah. Uh, so 
just as a quick note, we do have Bruce Howarth, uh, Manager of Planning with the County of Renfrew to my back right here. Uh, we also have the applicant, uh, Mr. Kowalski, who is representing Whitewater and Wildlands Tours and other representatives in, in the room. And I do believe Brian Whitehead is on virtually uh, with, us, um, with us at this meeting. He's representing JP2G Consultants, who's filed the applica application on behalf of the owner. Uh, so what we have before us is an official plan amendment uh, for the purposes of redesignating these lands. Uh, they could be shown through the map, if you could, uh, Clerk uh, Miller. Uh, from waterfront to waterfront exception five, and the purpose of this is to permit the creation of an additional eight new lots uh, through the consent process. Uh, so some councillors may be familiar that back in October, prior to the election, uh, 2022 election, uh, Mr. Mr. Kowalski and Brian made presentation to the former council with respect to this proposal, these eight new lots along Voyager Bay Trail, which is a private road. Um, subsequent to the presentation from the applicant, uh, the county did provide us with a letter uh, uh, outlining uh, some of the policies in the official plan. Uh, subsequent to that letter, uh, staff at the township level, staff at the county level, and the applicant met, and it was determined that um, an official plan amendment could be filed uh, to permit these eight additional laws. Essentially, what was outlined by the county at the time was that the development uh, of, of numerous lots, if you will, should generally proceed through plans of subdivision. Uh, in this present case, there are a total of 15 previous severances um, that were approved dating back to 2015. Um, in 2021, within those 15, there were four approved by the township. Um, and essentially, the approval of these eight lots would, uh, would allow for 23 lots total uh, by the consent approval process or severances. Um, so after the letter was received by the county and staff met with the proponent, we came back to council on October 5th uh, for some direction. Uh, at that time, a motion was passed by council that, the, uh, that they had given consideration to the preliminary de development proposal and, uh, and gave direction that, uh, we, that the township, the township council was uh, satisfactory that the development proceed through severances for these eight lots. So council was satisfied that we could move forward with these eight lots by severance, uh, subject to an official plan amendment, which, bring, which brings us here today, the official plan amendment. So um, what the amendment to the official plan would do is would place these lands within an exception zone, um, essentially to uh, um, uh, to, uh, to provide an exception with respect to the land division policies and allow for these eight applications to proceed. Um, I think that pretty well summarizes my presentation. I will note that um, the, uh, th th this official plan amendment doesn't create these eight lots the applicant will be still required to fi file eight separate severance applications to the township. And because we have delegated authority here in Whitewater Region, those applications would be presented to the Committee of Adjustment, which is the committee that reviews uh, l land severance applications. Um, in our report back in October, we identified a series of, con of, of studies or reports that would need to be submitted, ranging from a land use planning rationale, hydrogeological study, environmental impact study, archeological assessment. So these requirements uh, haven't been met yet, but they will be met as part of the severance process. So we're not, we haven't required the proponent to spend the thousands of dollars to do those studies at this point in time, because if the official plan amendment doesn't get approved, then he'll have spent all that money uh, without being able to get these eight lots. So when these applications come back to the committee of adjustment, uh, staff, if the studies haven't been completed at that time, we would staff recommend that these studies be prepared. Um, and maybe just lastly, 
there are attached to the report a couple letters, one from the Ministry of the Environment and the other one from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, uh, highlighting a couple other reports or studies. And these comments will be implemented as part of the severance process. So uh, we haven't asked the proponent to uh, uh, respond to these requirements yet. He would respond to them as part of the severance process. So uh, staff are supportive uh, with the proposed eight lots, and that was expressed in our report from back in October. Uh, we're in a situation here where there's already 15 lots. Um, certainly the... Uh, the best form of development for 23 lots would generally be through a plan of subdivision, but 15 already exist. An additional eight will not significantly significantly bring it bring uh, a much greater impact to the private road and, and this area. So we're supportive of these eight, and uh, and uh, certainly I don't want this to create a precedence, and I don't think it does. I mean, every application is considered on its merits, uh, but but again, um, we're in a situation here where. Uh, a plan of subdivision will would not bring any great additional value to this to this development in this case. So that'll end my presentation. Uh, perhaps it's probably not noted in your script, uh, Mayor Nicholson. But maybe if if the county, if Bruce wants to add anything, please allow him the opportunity to do so. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks, CAO. I'll just make one comment. You saw the clerk uh, and those people that are watching or or uh, maybe we'll review this later, you'll have seen the clerk passing some information out. We received three public comments by email this afternoon. Those will be included in the formal documents that go up to county with this file, but I wanted to make sure that the members of council had received um, those three. One arrived earlier this afternoon by email, you were all on it. Two other came through me, and those were distributed to you. Um, to so they'll be attached to the agenda, just to make sure the public knew what was going on there. Excellent, so now I'd like to invite our county planner, Mr. Horwarth. Horwarth, yes, please come to the mic and, and please. Howarth, sorry, Bruce. Thank you, Mayor Nicholson and Council. Uh, CAO uh, Burton did a great job of explaining the application. I don't have anything else to add uh, to that, but I'll just express my uh, gratitude. Thank you to Whitewater Region for hosting this meeting. Whenever we get applications at the county level uh, and there's a it's locally specific topic. We do request that the local municipality act as host for that, so we're grateful for that, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm able to pro uh, provide a couple comments on the next steps. So we are trying to process this uh, application as quickly as possible, and I've been working with uh, your CAO uh, to achieve that, and so to make it fit within our county structure to get it onto our committees and then onto our ultimately county council for a decision. Uh, we're under a fairly tight timeline that I know your CAO is working hard to, to uh, achieve. So as a result of this public meeting, what we'll do is take back the comments that we receive. Uh, what I'm hearing is mostly those comments are going to be in support of the official plan amendment, but we'll take those comments, uh, whether it's from council, I think you've already indicated uh, a resolution of support for this application. So we'll take that under consideration, council's support, uh, the letters of support that we've received so far. County uh, staff will prepare a report that will go to our committee and then council structure and hopefully a for a decision at the next county council meeting. And then that would trigger uh, the future steps under the Planning Act. There's a 20 day appeal period and then I'm assuming there won't be any appeals because everybody seems to be in support of it. But uh, pending no appeals and the official plan amendment would be in effect and then that would allow those future consent applications to be considered by the township. And I'm available to answer any questions that uh, any council members have. Thank you, Mary. Excellent. So now what I'd like to do is give the applicant or his designated rep the opportunity to speak on behalf of their application. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I believe that uh, Brian Whitehead was going to make comments and he should probably go before me. Please, Sean, if you can log in through, please. Excellent. Welcome, Mr. Whitehead. Your Worship, it's a pleasure to be here. Unfortunately, Excellent. I couldn't uh, make it in person tonight. Well, we always yes. appreciate it when you make time to come. So please, the floor um, is yours. Yeah. You go ahead. Thank please. you. And um, thanks uh, also to uh, Link LaRue for sending me a revised link. I was having a, a serious moment of panic for, before this meeting, that thinking I wouldn't be able to attend. Um, and yeah, I uh, wish I could be there, but unfortunately I have a cold, so I thought it would be best if I participated from home. 
Um, I won't add too much to what uh, Ivan has already said. I think Ivan's given a pretty um, balanced and thorough report to council. Um, what I can say is that um, we started pre-consulting about these additional lots uh, um, in June of last year, and uh, there was some significant discussions with the staff from the township and the county about what process should be followed. Um, and uh, the way the official plan is, and because Whitewater is both the local council and the approval authority for consents, um, there is enough flexibility in the official plan to consider these lots in accordance with the uh, policies of the official plan, whether it goes by severance or subdivision, it still has to comply with, with the uh, policies of the, of the county's official plan. Um, there has been a lot of severances granted. Uh, uh, majority of them were granted uh, under the um, authority of the county when they were the consent granting authority. The last four were granted uh, uh, by the township, but uh, they had been pre uh, consulted with the county first. So, um, and I think the trigger here is uh, in the in the staff report uh, is that um, to require a plan of subdivision at this stage could be viewed as somewhat onerous. Uh, so, uh, but having said that, uh, the position we're taking is that it's not an exercise of trying to circumvent any planning policies or, or studies or requirements that might otherwise be required. It'll be the same requirements as would if it did go by plan of subdivision. Um, and uh, it will complete the development of the property. Now, the Voyager Bay property is, or the original holding is a very large holding. Uh, it's over 300 acres, probably 350 acres. Uh, two of the, or three of the previous consents that were, that I haven't mentioned, excuse me, were in fact consents to create bush lots. So there's the, the 350 acres were divided essentially by um, Voyager Bay Trail. Um, on the north side is uh, Katie's lot, which is over 100 acres. And then there's a Joel's lot, which is probably also 100 acres. And then uh, what's left over is actually the Voyager, Voyager Bay property, which is the peninsula portion where the, most of the lots are located. There's only 20 acres left and these these eight lots will complete the development potential of that acre, one acre parcel of land. There's no development proposed at, on either of Katie's lots or, or uh, uh, property or Joel's at this time. But um, uh, at this time, the focus is on, uh, so the process that will, if there is a process to developing those lands will have to be determined at that time. Uh, and as Ivan said, we're not embarking on this necessarily to set a precedent. Um, now, you have received correspondence from the province on this, uh, Ministry of the Environment in particular, and I'd ask Council not to get too concerned about that uh, message. It does, uh, it does come across as somewhat, I and mean, I would say, um, uh, I, I can try to be diplomatic, but it comes across to me as being a little bit like we don't know what we're doing and uh, paternalistic in terms of uh, what approach should be, should be taken. And uh, it references uh, uh, studies from my planning report that I submitted with this application and, and tries to point out some shortcomings. But uh, my point in all this is that we know exactly what the scope of work is gonna be needed to address these studies. And the township has a, a very capable uh, a planning staff uh, retained that we'll be working with. And um, I'm confident that we can uh, so go through this process and uh, come out with an outcome that can be considered as good planning. So um, I won't I won't speak too much longer. I just wanted to give council some comfort to know that that uh, we're not trying to hide anything or pull anything over. Uh, we want to we want to follow the process and we want to do the appropriate studies and get everything done according to the county official plan and uh, work with the township in doing it. And we found that um, it's it's somewhat yeah, easier. And, and faster and more productive to work with uh, the local municipality when decision making is that is at the uh, local level. So that's all I really have to say, uh, but I'm available if there's any questions. Excellent. We'll, <clears throat> we'll just hold you there, Mr. Whitehead, if you can stay online and we'll turn the floor over to the applicant, Mr. Kowalski. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Mayor, <clears throat> Council, staff, 
Bruce, uh, thank you for being here today and allowing me this opportunity to speak. I, I have a written presentation which I passed out to you. And so, dear Mayor and Council, I ask your support for Renfrew County to modify its official plan to allow eight severances through consent to complete Voyager Bay. The previous council supported the severances, but the county would not approve them without either a plan of subdivision or a change to the county official plan. While in business almost 50 years, the plan of subdivision process is too onerous and expensive for the average resident of Whitewater region. If a plan of subdivision process is a requirement, not only will it be the end of Voyager Bay, but it will be the end of development in our region, except for large developers. The consent process still man mandates all the studies, but usually peer review of those studies and the huge upfront cost is not required. If Whitewater Region is to have development, it must come from the consent process. As, and I have in quotes, intended consequence of the Planning Act and the requirement for a plan of subdivision is to thwart or stop rural development. I and many of you want to live on the land and not be forced into towns and cities with municipal services. Our future is tourism and residential development by ordinary citizens and not just big developers. In 1989, I lobbied Parks Canada to create a national park to preserve the last wild section of Canada's most historical river, the Ottawa. Unsuccessful, I tried to do it, my, I decided to do it myself and slowly acquired almost 4,000 acres on both sides of the Ottawa River uh, pictured here. Although not a true national park, the concept of the National Whitewater Park is slowly becoming a reality. <clears throat> Selling lots on Voyager Bay has provided part of the funding for this endeavor. There is still work to be done and Council's approval of my request will help ensure our greatest municipal asset is protected for generations to come. Thank you for your support. And what I would like to add in addition to this written submission is that uh, uh, my, my feelings about growth and development in Whitewater Region, and I'm a true believer of Whitewater Region exceptionalism. Honestly, this is, we have the greatest area west of the Rocky Mountains for paddle sports and everything that goes with it. And one of the reasons that I'm so fervent about the um, consent process and so against the plan of subdivision is that, uh, uh, as you probably don't know, but uh, every two years the, uh, there's the World Kayak Championships. And um, uh, we, we hosted them here on the Ottawa in 1997, in 2007, and 2015. In 2023, they're going to be in Columbus, Georgia. And I happened to be there last week because uh, both my son and daughter uh, will be uh, competing for Canada. And uh, they were tr they're training, and I wanted to watch, and my sister lives in Atlanta. So it was a good way. And so when we were down there, we stayed at an Airbnb. And so when you... The world's largest hotel here right now is Marriott, okay? But larger than Marriott is Airbnb. And so what, and the difference is, and nothing wrong with Marriott, but Airbnb is a collection of small people. You know, small homeowners, not, you know, people that might have uh, an extra unit, a room in their house, whatever. And to me, the future of development for Whitewater Region is tourism and residential development. They go hand in hand. People want to come to Whitewater Region. It's obvious what's happened in the last couple of years, but they also want all the amenities that tourism can bring to them. And so it has to go hand in hand. And what happens in the old days, because I've been in tourism for almost 50 years now, there were bed and breakfasts. You don't find bed and breakfast anymore. And what the bed and breakfast did is it allowed individual residents to be, uh, be like Marriott only in, a, in a very tiny way. And what it did for the traveler is that it provided uh, local information, local color, and 
organizations like uh, Airbnb, VRBO, is a chance for many of the residents in Whitewater region to be a part of this movement. And, but for those people to participate, they can't do it through a plan of subdivision. They can do it through the consent process because the consent process is for the little guy. And even though I've been in business for 50 years, I find myself a plan of subdivision so onerous. And so anyway, that is my, that's the reason why I'm here. One of the things with Voyager Bay is that by completing this project, I will, I will be able to bring hydro to it. So right now there's no hydro to Voyager Bay. And uh, the people that live there now, uh, some of them permanently through a combination of propane and solar are doing quite well, but it's always nice to have as a backup Ontario Hydro. So I do appreciate uh, the county planner and his efforts. I do appreciate Ivan when he was the municipal planner doing what he did. And uh, to me, I'm a true believer in Whitewater region exceptionalism. And I truly believe that each and every one of you are on council because you believe the same thing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kowalski. Can I just ask one? Sorry, one question, just because it was a question that came up before and I just wanted answered public. Uh, I had a question about the map that you provided. Yes. Can you just point out where Voyager Bay might be on so this wait, well, map? Voyager Bay is not on this oh. map. Yeah. And I probably should have done it, but I didn't. And the reason is my uh, sort of my mission in life is to preserve the whitewater section of the Ottawa River. This is the last wild section on the most historical river in Canada and it ought to be preserved. And so I did try, I lobbied Parks Canada very hard uh, in 1989 to get them to designate a, uh, uh, a real national park. I was not successful. I had the harebrained idea, I'm gonna do it myself. It's a very expensive undertaking. If I could afford it, I wouldn't even do Voyager Bay. Like I don't believe in selling land. I'm only doing it because the sales that we've had so far is to color all this dark green because if I didn't do it, and not that I'm against waterfront homes and waterfront cottages, but this is the last wild, set. even myself, I don't live on the water. I wish I did, but I don't want to I don't want to build on the water because I would have to build in the last wild section and I just don't want to do it. And so Voyager Bay is downstream uh, several kilometers from where this picture is. And the reason why I have not why I've chosen to develop Voyager Bay is that it's a very attractive piece of property. In particular, uh, like for example, and I've, I've, used, I've used this example a lot of times, uh, Chris Thompson, a Brit, who was a river guide for us in his college days, decided, although his, uh, his degree is international finance, decided that he wanted to live here. And so he went back to school in London and became a brewmaster. But somebody like that needs, to, he's a paddler, he wants to be able to paddle to his home. And so at Voyager Bay, uh, the R Ottawa River down there is flooded. That is not original river. And so that's why I, I don't feel I'm compromising sort of my mission in life because uh, it's, it's flooded part of the Ottawa River by through the construction of the Chinot Dam. So Voyager Bay on this map is about uh, four or five kilometers downstream. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mr. Kowalski. I just, I noticed we have a couple members of the public with us. <laughs> Three. I just want to make sure the next step for me is to open it up to the public for any other comments. So I just want to make sure that we do that. Yes, please. You just come to the mic, introduce yourself, where you're from, and, and you can go ahead. Thanks, uh, Mayor and Council. So my name is Alistair Baird, and I'm, I live in Armprior, but I'm a property owner in Voyager Bay. So I'm probably in the room today, the one of the closest neighbours to uh, where these eight lots are located. 
So our family uh, bought property in Voyager Bay a few years ago. Uh, we've enjoyed it. My wife is a farm girl from southwestern Ontario. She never, ever, ever wanted to live in the bush, but she saw Voyager Bay and we're there now, so it's her property. Um, but we, we, as the closest neighbours to this, we absolutely support this and we're very excited by, by council, uh, council's uh, support, it seems to be. This, this is a good thing for uh, Whitewater Region. We look forward to having new residents, tourists, neighbours and friends there. We've already met a number of people. It's, it's uh, be becoming a community down there at Voyager Bay. Um, and it is, I think I have to agree with Joe, the future for Whitewater Region big part of it is tourism, major part of it for us all over the Ottawa Valley, and residential development. Um, we know there's housing shortage in the big, there's housing shortages everywhere. These are more houses. And uh, also that aspect of these residences becoming a tourism property through those who wish to do uh, Airbnb or VRBO or other rental system is very real. It's very genuine. And you don't go near any large resort area, especially ski resorts anywhere in North America, and there's not a, a, a huge number of Airbnbs there that are uh, helping the, continue to help the local economy and help the, the resort business as well. So just, you know, this is um, all the new owners there are new ratepayers to the county, so are we. Uh, these eight lots will produce eight new ratepayers. Uh, it's uh, citizens who will bring their friends and their family members here and again expose the area to more people uh, and uh, people who like the lifestyle here. It's really a simple, no cost economic and community development tool and uh, just as a resident near this development, very close to this, this, these eight lots, ho wholly support it and thanks council, we, we really support your, I, I would be very excited if Whitewater takes this step and, and helps keep us moving forward. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Any other members of the public that wish to speak? Yeah. So same process, just have to introduce yourself and, and where you live, please. Hi, I'm Sam McCray. I'm a resident uh, born in Whitewater Region. I'm also a lot owner and currently building a cottage in the Whitewater, uh, Whitewater Regional Development. I also own a construction company, so the amount of work that we've quoted for uh, additional lot owners that are unable to now build or won't move forward with their project is, uh, is basically on hold because of the hold for the hydro. I myself have invested $40,000 in solar for our property. Not wasn't the most ideal, but it's a beautiful spot and there is a pile of interest. We work throughout Eastern Ontario and everywhere we go, people ask me about Whitewater Region and Voyager Bay. And I just wanted to thank everybody for having us here today. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Mr. McCray. Any other members of the public? No, and Bruce, there's no one out in the hall. No, good, I just wanna make sure. Excellent, so what we'll do is we'll next turn it over to council. So you'll have an opportunity to answer questions. There's a lot of people who may want to try to respond, whether it's the county, the applicant, Mr. Whitehead. So what I'm going to do is if, if, if the CAO can't answer it, I'll get him to redirect to the most appropriate person to answer the question. Fair? Good. So we'll open it up to council. Is there any questions from council? Councillor Tabbert. I am... Um when I saw this, I had a lot of questions. I did speak to Ivan and he answered quite a few of them. But when I look at, and I know that the questions I have now are pretty simple, but I'm looking at this as somebody who's really new. And it shows that there, the green, it says, is retained lands. So how do those people get onto their property if not from the water? Because it says that they don't own, like even the road is, I mean, has a green line on it. Am I missing something here? I know I'm new to this, so. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and explain. So basically, the everything that's in yellow has been surveyed for the road, which will be a private road. Um, the retained lands, I guess, like the retained lands and that strip of road with the cul-de-sac and the eight lots pro all form part of one lot today. But as part of the severance process, they will all be severed independently. So. The road will be surveyed, 
with the cul-de-sac, the eight lots would be surveyed and then the retained lands would be surveyed. So they'd all be able to be conveyed separately uh, in individual deeds, if you will. So those aren't severed yet? As it stands, one that's big... all one big piece of, one big, one piece of land. Okay. Yes. Okay. That I didn't realize yeah. that. Okay. And um, Joe and Alistair, you both talked about the Airbnbs and the... Um, Hmm? Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> thank you. Okay. So, Mr. Kowalski and Mr. Baird spoke about um, the Airbnbs and the people renting their homes out. I was at Roma uh, last week, and there was a, a very interesting discussion on this. And in order for that to go ahead, have you, have we, we haven't looked at this at all yet, eh? Airbnb? No. So, so our, our, Anything like that. So Airbnbs or short-term accommodations, as I'll word it here, um, are essentially, uh, in most cases, governed by, our, by a zoning bylaw, and in some cases, a licensing bylaw. So our zoning bylaws predate the amalgamation, so they're from the 90s. So we do not have any policies around short-term accommodations at the present time. Uh, so we don't govern if somebody rents their space out to a tourist for four days, six days, two weeks, or whatever. We don't govern that as it currently stands. Uh, we are in the process of reviewing our zoning bylaws, consolidating them, and looking at different policies. Uh, and one of the items, amongst that many others, is short-term accommodations. So. Um, to, because we're on the topic, I'll give a quick update. So um, we will be engaging the public in the short term in the next couple months on our draft zoning bylaw, which is a consolidation of Westmeath and Cobden and, and Beechburg and Ross. Uh, so in the next couple months, we'll see draft policies around short-term accommodations, and we would likely bring forward at the same time, a draft licensing bylaw to, in the public consultation process. That way we're consulting the public with the two items, the zoning bylaw and maybe the licensing bylaw all at the same time. So no policies now, we don't regulate it. It doesn't matter to us right now if somebody rents their house for six months, two years or three days. We don't govern that at the present time, but we are looking into it. Okay, and I'm glad to hear that because this presentation, uh, it was four different speakers and while they do have the short-term rentals, um, it is it has to be uh, w watched because it was very interesting. I, uh, I'm hoping that we can get a copy of that and council can look at it because I thoroughly, I wasn't sure what to expect and that wasn't. The other thing I have and um, through somebody here. Um, so we have Sam McRae and we have Alistair Baird and we have, um, I'm not sure if there's any others, but obviously there are her own property here and they like it because it's nice and quiet and there's not a lot of people. But I'm looking here and I see a whole lot of people moving in there. Um, so I don't think they're gonna have private property or private as much as they thought they may in the end. But I do support this, but uh, the short-term rental was the one that really scared me when that started to talk. And one more question. Do we have a last name on the person who sent the email? I'll have to check which email it is. That's Chris Thompson. Oh, oh okay. Thank you. Yeah, Chris Thompson. Okay. Good. That's so I'm all just gonna, I have. I'm just going to follow up on that one because I know the applicant would like to make a comment, which I think I will allow in a sec. Um, thanks, CAO, for the update on the short-term rentals. I know it's off topic for what we're discussing tonight but brought up by some of the public comments, so worthwhile to investigate. And, and just to reiterate, those are one acre lots or greater uh, in most cases, so there is a lot of space there when you're talking about privacy. So good. Anything you wanna add to any of that comments? Good. Um, before I allow another question, I'm just gonna see if the applicant would like to respond to some of those questions. Yes, please go ahead. I would in, in response to your comment. Connie, and so with with everything, there's good and bad. I listened to the lady about snowmobiling. There's good snowmobilers and there's bad snowmobilers. I've just spent uh, two weeks in an Airbnb in Columbus, Georgia, and the rules and regulations that the property owner uh, has, and it, it's all monetary. Uh, 
penalties, and so it's it's easily controlled. You know, I I personally don't think that the municipality, you know, it can if it wants, but it doesn't. If if you're a property owner and you're renting out these things, there's rules and regulations about the garbage and the bedding and all this kind of stuff, and you're financially penalized. Uh, uh, I don't think it will be a problem. In, you're there just because this this will there will be an opportunity for public debate on that sure. zoning bylaw. Just <laughs> we're going to get going on this tonight. We want to address this one and move on to our other issues. Okay, so good. We'll hold that one there. Other questions from council? Yes, Councillor Bell. So I have uh, yeah I wrote a few things down here. Um, so. Joe mentioned that uh, with the uh, introduction of these eight lots, that's going to be able to uh, bring down hydro. Do we have a guarantee on that? Is there any sort of formal agreement that's put in place? Is there a letter? Is there, is there anything confirming that that is going to be the case moving forward guaranteed? No, there's no guarantee. I just need to be able to afford to do it. And if I can afford to do it, I am. Thank, thanks. Let me redirect the questions, Mr. Kowalski. Just, <laughs> sorry, I'm going to keep order on it. But just in addition to that, can you speak to the conditions and limitations put on consents yeah, for so, things like utilities? Yeah, so when I, spoke, when I presented the report, I said it's a series of conditions, like the studies and reports. Uh, if the, the hydro matter is something that we are aware of as staff, and we want to ensure that development can proceed, uh, that is feasible and, and, and has access to electricity. Uh, so when the severance applications will be filed, that matter will be you know observed at greater depth by staff with the applicant, whether or not it would be a condition of approval of the lots or a condition to allow the lots to, to issue a permit in, a, in an agreement, a development agreement. So we will find a way to ensure that the hydro is put in uh, at some point in time, there will be a requirement to do so, or, or in some way, shape, or form in that way. You got another question, Councillor Bell? Yeah, I have a couple questions. Okay. Um, so, with this, there was there's been 15 severances, four approved by the township. There's going to be 23 total, with the eight that are that are currently on the table. So, at this point, with the with the eight that are being applied for at the moment. Um, the comment from the staff is that uh, an application for subdivision would be onerous for the remaining eight to be to be approved. So I'm just wondering, with 23 total lots being severed off, if if this goes ahead and it's approved, how did it get to like generally it's five lots off one piece of land, right? So now we're going to be at 23. How do, how do we get to that number without, like, how, how does that take place whenever, in general, it's up to a maximum of five with the one, one retained lot? See you. Yeah, so I, you want to engage Kelly. so I guess a couple of points. So the policies and past practice, I guess, is two things. So the policies in the official plan uh, state that you're permitted to have three severances. Um, as of from the original holding, which dates back to 1971. Um, the official plan continues to say that you could have two more severances, which you're referencing the five, subject to additional criteria. And then the official plan continues to say that you could have more than five lots by severance, subject to even more criteria. So when I explain it to residents, it just gets harder and harder or more more reports, more studies that need to be submitted uh, to to get more and more lots by severance. Um, I think, how did we get here? I mean, um, how did we get to any situation where there's 11 or 12 or 15 lots by severance? Um, my understanding since I arrived here in 2019 is generally applicants were filing sort of three applications initially, and then they would file two and then two, and then two, and then you find out that now you're at, you know, eight or nine or ten. So I think the, what's happened here, and Brian's available, and so is Mr. Kowalski uh, to provide some insight, and same with Bruce, but in this case, there was an original three, 
and then two applied and then two applied and then the question was where are we going with this right like wh what's the end game if you will uh, i think when we consult with applicants or property owners when they're thinking of doing two or three that is the point in time when you should be asking what's the end what's the development proposal what's the full build out and then really guide the process um, so i think in other instances in our community uh, there are places where there's been three and then two and then two and then two so i mean What's happened here has occurred somewhere else, uh, but in other locations. Uh, so I think that's kind of how it's played out, if you will. And then now my position, I guess, is I know there's going to, there will likely be eight lots proposed. I don't want to see them two, two, two. Let's deal with it front end and let's just be done with the development potential of this lot. So my direction to the applicant and owner is what do you, where's the end goal and let's get there and let's get the right steps to get there and the right process uh, rather than go two, 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 right? So that's, that's kind of been my direction to, to the applicant. Just want to make sure county going to add anything No, unless Brian does. Sorry, just for the public, I asked county if they wanted to um, make any comments to, to the CAO's comments, then the applicant and his representative, so. We're good? Okay, Councillor Bell. So I just have two more questions. I'll give you one and then I'm gonna to jump to Councillor. Sound, sounds good, sorry, I've got a few notes down here. Um, so you talk about, uh, it was mentioned a couple times, um, not trying to circumvent the subdivision application or not trying to get away from uh, you know, the, uh, the restrictions that are put in place by that, that subdivision. So I spoke to, I spoke to Joe earlier and two of those things would be an ups, uh, a upfront application fee as well as a peer review. Are there any other specifics? Cause it is mentioned in the MECP, um, uh, letter, uh, that came through. Uh, and I know Brian mentioned that maybe not to read into that so much because it, it does, it makes it out like you're not, I'm not saying this, I'm just commenting on what Brian said that you don't know what you're doing, but obviously there's going to be other studies included and all that. But are there anything, is there anything uh, else specifically that you would have to go through through that subdivision process that you're not going to get through the consent process through the, the township, like if that makes sense. No, if it I'm does. Clear yes. enough. And the question has come from members of the public. I've heard it before. So CAO, can you respond please? Um, I would say that uh, the policies in the official plan generally steer plans of subdivision where there are numerous studies and reports, which is in fact the case here. So the, the proponent will be required to do all of the assessments that would be required for plan sub subdivision. Uh, however, is generally suited where there's a public road. Uh, so in this case, the development's on a private road uh, where a plan of subdivision, there's typically a, a municipal road and some infrastructure. So that would, you know, the, 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 the construction of a municipal, of a public road to be transferred to the township would generally be the process for a plan of subdivision. Uh, you, I, I guess the, 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 the thing with a plan of subdivision is that, the, um, is that when you're done and approved, all of the lots get created at once. And this is something that Mr. Kowalski and I have spoke about before, and he might want to elaborate on it, is that at that point you're immediately taxed, like, like there's, there's taxation created from it as individual lots. Uh, so in some situations that could be burdensome to the applicant or the owner to hold those lots uh, until they are all sold. So that might be an additional a substantial cost with the plan subdivision development process. Uh, but to highlight the comments from the ministries, these requirements will be managed as part of the severance process. Just because we're not gonna omit them from record. Like we are now aware of the species at risk piece the stormwater management, which we were going to deal with through through lock grading and, and the like, but um, certainly uh, 
th these matters were going to be dealt with at the at the consent process, the severance process. Excellent. Okay. So just because the COO indicated, I'll give the same opportunity. County, would you like to add any comments to that? Sure. Yes. If you can come to the mic, please. So I think yeah, CAO Burton did provide a very good summary of some of the key differences. So a lot of times when we're dealing with consent applications versus the plan subdivisions, we with the plan subdivision provides us that opportunity to take a look at the development as a whole and where are the impacts. Because a lot of the times what we find is when we're developing lots, there are impacts when we're developing one lot will have an offsite impact or it could uh, impact an adjacent lot or you may want the lots to work in tandem together. For example, uh, use stormwater management is a good example that's come up. If we're developing on a lot by lot basis or a piecemeal fashion, the impact, the total impact of the development is in managing the stormwater can often be get, I'll say, forgotten. It was just a lot like feel like a lot of times in our, my job now with these days, it's more about the stormwater than anything else. It's less about planning, it's more about stormwater. How are we dealing with these impacts? So with the plan subdivision allows you to take a look at the whole development, make sure that the appropriate systems are put in place, whether it's drainage ditches or stormwater management facilities, or it could be an easement across properties or you know down property boundary lines that you're managing the stormwater uh, in a manner that takes into the into account the whole development. Same with an environmental impact study. So instead of just looking at how does this one lot maybe impact the environment, you look at the, the development as a whole, what are the impacts, how do we mitigate against those impacts, you have a much better ability to manage the project as a whole through the plan of subdivision and making sure that the development works together so that when one lot owner, uh, they have those requirements that they have on how to develop that lot fit within the greater scheme of the whole development so that it works and that we can manage and ensure that the development occurs in a way that you know the future lot owners will be successful, the township will be successful, and there are any impacts on the environment, whether it's or infrastructure is successful at the end of the day. And there are other impacts there, like uh, costs involved in plan subdivision too. I, I understand why people may be hesitant to want to go through the plan subdivision process. For example, uh, there's land titles issues, uh, you have to get absolute title for the plan subdivision process, which takes time and money. So there are definitely uh, added costs to a plan subdivision versus consents. Uh, Mr. Kowalski did mention, I think, the peer review costs. So when the plan subdivision comes to the County of Renfrew, we do require that study to be peer reviewed to make sure that it's meeting uh, certain criteria. So th yeah, the plan subdivision process can be more onerous and uh, I'll say more expensive, but uh, there, are, there are reasons for that. And anyways, so we are going through this process today to recognizing what the development is. And uh, as uh, I think uh, Brian and uh, C.A. Laburn have indicated today that there are steps that the township's gonna be taking through that consent process to try to replicate a lot of that other, that work that would other would be done and that review that would be done through a plan subdivision process. They're gonna try to be mimicking that through the review the consent applications. Perfect, thank you. And last one, just again, because the CAO mentioned it, I'll offer the applicant the opportunity to speak or as a rep. Would you like to speak, Mr. Kowalski, or do you want Mr. Whitehead? You're good? Mr. Whitehead, do you want to speak to that at all? You're good? I'm good, I think, yeah, I think it's been covered well. Excellent, okay, sorry, I'm just being thorough. I want to make sure everybody has an opportunity. I, Councilor Bell, you can hold your last question and we'll go to Councilor Trim. Uh, Mr. Mayor, through you to uh, uh, Mr. Burton, I, I'm just wondering if it hasn't been done, could one of the conditions be that um, uh, it be determined that it is possible and safe for emergency vehicles to access this private road? I'm thinking, I'm thinking in particular fire trucks can get in and out easily and perhaps pass each other on the way, that sort of thing. Uh, is that reasonable? Yeah, I don't think that, that that would be an issue. I think in the past we have had the fire department enter the, the development, if you will, like in the last couple of years. Uh, there have been some significant improvements to the private road in the last uh, 12 months. Uh, so certainly as a condition of the consent, we could uh, have within the development agreement that the fire department do an, a, a site inspection. I think there's a, there's a fee to the applicant to have the fire department do that, but certainly they, they, they could, uh, we could, we could, we could implement that as a condition. 
I think the fire department uh, fought a pretty significant fire in that area this past summer. Uh, I didn't hear of any concerns about traffic flow, but certainly we could impose that as a condition. Yes, or recommend that. Excellent. No other questions. I'll go back to Councilor Bell for his last one. Sorry, I'm no, 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 taking up the time here. No, it's good. The public has these questions, and it's 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 appropriate for us to get them answered. Yeah. Um, yeah. So my last note, I, I guess, would just be that. Um, Joe mentioned that you know he's a whitewater ex exceptionalist. I would agree. I'm I'm very much the same way. I think we we have some of the greatest scenery. I think we have some of the greatest riverfronts, some of the greatest farmland, some of the greatest bush properties in Ontario. And I'm glad to live here. I'm proud to live here. I want my kids to have that same experience if they choose to live here, and I want them to live here. One of the things whenever I look at that that map that I think we have to be careful of from a development perspective is just that idea of sustainable development. If we look at, you know, there's 21 lots on that peninsula. Whenever I grew up fishing on that river, there was no developments there, right? It was basically pristine woodland. Now it's, it's, it's a community and like Alistair mentioned, you know, they're creating a community down there, which is great. We have to, we have to provide some opportunity for, for development, economic growth. We want more taxpayers in the area. We want people to foster that community within Whitewater. But I guess it comes back to that point where how did we get to 23 lots when generally we do the, you know, the three and then the five and then the two and the two. I think we just have to be careful moving forward that the things that make Whitewater so special are our riversides and our, our bushlands, our farmlands. We don't pave over it essentially. I think we have to be we have to be very careful of that so that the people that want to come here come here for the same reasons that I enjoy living here, that I want my kids to grow up and have the same experience that I know there's a number of people that use that stretch of river that appreciate the pristine this pristine nature that that Joe wants to preserve upriver in that whitewater region, there are people that enjoy that scenery down downriver as well. So um, I think it's just mostly a comment that you know we I think we have to be careful that we don't break up what makes the whitewater region so special. And I I don't think these eight lots are are going to make much of a difference at this point the way that this has been developed but i think it's just a point of concern to keep in the back of everybody's head moving forward yeah, i think that's an excellent point and this public process involving the opa and, and looking at the eight lots all at once i think offers some of that public transparency on this development i i completely agree good councillor olmstead yeah, did, may i make a comment on yes, uh, Councillor Bell's? yeah i would agree with Councillor bell um i think there's always a tipping point that you reach, that you, you have to be careful of development. Um, I think in our case, in our region, um, we didn't have a planner or really a, a, a planning division in Whitewater Region until five years ago, maybe four years ago, right, four years ago. Uh, and not to say that it wasn't properly done previous, it's just we didn't have the day-to-day -day communication or the knowledge of, of discussing any of this with, with our own planner. And to try to discuss it with somebody at county, you know, was, was very onerous in that, you know, they're extremely busy. Uh, so to try to take time, and we all know who has time to, to discuss these type of things. So it, it's really helped my knowledge of the process. And um, just having a planner, I think, has helped the Whitewater Region get a better vision of what we want our region to be. So uh, I, I agree with Councillor Bell and his comments that we have to be very careful about when and where development happens. Um, and and I, I think this is the right thing for this area of land. Maybe a kilometre up the river is not the right thing, but I, I, I've been down here quite often. And it, it's a really remote area. Um, I think it even gives the public an opportunity to see what's down there and see these beautiful homes on, that, that, that have already started on the river. Um, I, I, obviously, I don't think we should be doing this every every kilometer up the river, but in this particular case, it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Councillor Olmstead. Any other questions from Council? Okay. Good. Uh, well, last thing, I just I'll give the applicant one last opportunity if they if you wish or you want Mr. Whitehead to address Council. I'm fine. You're fine.
fine. Good. And Mr. Whitehead? I'm fine, Your, your Worship. Excellent. Okay. So, um, full disclosure, when I got, uh, we read the recommendation to the front, we already approved this recommendation because the way the council support the solicitor plan amendment. So we've already had a mover. It was Councillor Trim and seconded by Councillor Tabert. And you all voted in favor to accept and or to support this amendment as it goes forward to count council. Now I did that out of order, completely out of order. We finished the public input. We've received, you've had your chance to answer the questions. At this point in time, I just want to make sure that we do the process correctly. Um, do I need to redo it or can I just ask for consensus on what we did? I would ask the mover and seconder if they're okay with... Good. So I will go to the mover first. Are you okay with the recommendation that was before us? Do you want me to reread the recommendation? No. I, I, I don't need that and I, I remain in favor. Good. Councillor Tavert, you remain in second? Good. Yes, I do. And everyone, uh, just to reaffirm, everybody's in favor? Just a show of hands. Yes. Excellent. And it passes. Good. Good. It feels like something else should happen right now. <laughs> that was a very long agenda item. Thank you very much for your time. Mr. Kowalski, you and your team, we appreciate that. Bruce, I hope you can get off. Thank you so much. And Mr. Whitehead, appreciate you logging on. Thank okay. You. Uh, next one. Actually, uh, we have them on. We have the speakers on standby, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a two minute recess. If you need a bio break, take two minutes to get to the washroom and we'll be back on in, in two minutes, 6.09, so.
Excellent. If I can get everybody to sit down, we will call the meeting to order at 612. Slight delay. Uh, line up for the washrooms. So obviously the bio break was required. Um, what we'll do next is we're going to move on to our next agenda item. Uh, the WPHA, sorry, WHPA Delineation and Source Water Protection Plan for Beechburg and Haley Town Site. I understand that we have a presenter. I will turn it over to the CAO to, <clears throat> I'll turn it over to our Public Works Manager to provide a brief introduction uh, to our speaker, please. Lane. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, uh, tonight we have uh, Steve uh, Livingstone from uh, Geocentrics Engineering. Uh, welcome, Steve. Uh, sorry, we're, uh, I was uh, longer than what I thought it was going to be, but we had some good, good uh, discussion at the council. Um, uh, tonight, he's presenting uh, the presentation on the, the uh, well head protection areas. Um, and then to that, I'll pass it over to you, Steve. Okay, great. And Thank I think you you're much. sharing your screen, I believe. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen for sure. So I was going to say good afternoon, but I guess it's good, e good evening now. So that was a long first agenda item. I'm not quite sure um, how long I have, but... Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Nicholson and Council for having me today. I really appreciate the opportunity to discuss our study. It's um, it's wellhead protection, delineation, and source water protection for both uh, Beechburg and Haley. And it's it might get fairly technical, and there might be some acronyms that I just need to stop and, and talk. So uh, let me know. I don't know how we can... Um, you know, if there's hands raised, because uh, I think I don't want to miss things if you have questions as I kind of move th through the slides. I have about 26 slides. Um, not sure how much time I have right now, but um, uh, maybe I'll just let me get uh, let me get going and we can kind of walk through this. Does that make sense? Yeah, we'll try and if if possible, 15 minutes. If you can make 26 oh. slides in 15 minutes, that'd be appreciated. Okay. <laughs> and if there are okay. questions or someone's throwing something at me here, I will stop you and ask you to clarify. Oh, okay, awesome. Perfect, Thanks thank so you. Much. Okay. So I think, let me know when it comes up on your screen, you can see it? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, great. Let me get Mr. Pointer out if I can. Mr. Pointer, okay. Yeah, so as Elaine mentioned, it's the well heart protection, delineation source water protection. Um, and really my goal at the end of the day is to go through everything with you and make you kind of practicing hydrogeologists at the end of this. So the primary objectives for this project were to assess and, and, and really protect the sources of groundwater um, at your um, uh, both sites, uh, including the municipals at both Beechburg and Haley. And it was broken up into two um, two major phases. The first phase is the assessment phase, and that's really about um, the delineation of the uh, groundwater uh, in terms of the source. Uh, that includes the wellhead protection areas for both Beechburg and Haley. And then part of that sort of technical part of the first phase is the identification of any vulnerability of the aquifers to contamination. So things like road salt, septic systems would be uh, things like that, which would identify uh, within that, uh, um, within this phase, the second phase is taking the outcomes of these two uh, uh, two phases or two parts of this uh, first phase, and developing a source water protection plan. And part of that outcome is really the development of proposed risk management uh, measures. And those risk management measures could be used as part of, say, an official plan, uh, perhaps some bylaws or community best practices. So here's essentially the overall approach that uh, that's taken. And the, this is really from the uh, MECP approach as well. Uh, they have a kind of a standard guidance on how things are, are done. So uh, the first phase of it comes across here with delineation. Um, so that's source water protection delineation, inventory, determining the susceptibility of it. And then underneath this box, for me anyway, is <laughs> I see all I see is my head is the uh, engagement of the public, and then this back end phase is our protection phase. So that that's that's really our planning phase that I, I mentioned in the earlier slide. 
The, the part about public engagement, uh, we, we initially sent out uh, some information on flyers, et cetera, um, to the public, um, showing what's, what's happening and our objectives, et cetera. But typically the engagement piece is almost towards the end after some of the planning parts have been put together and then it helps inform the public a bit more. So that's kind of where we stand right now. So in terms of our reports and, and kind, of, uh, kind of logic, if you will, start off with wellhead delineation, moved into threats, and then the final phase, which was phase two, which was our protection plan. So this is kind of geology, hydrogeology 101. So over here, we have a well that's drilled and it's being pumped. And you can see that groundwater is being extracted through soil and uh, fractured rock, et cetera, coming into the well. Uh, some of the uh, water is not, uh, is not being captured, kind of flows around this area. So that's basically considered our wellhead uh, capture zone or wellhead, uh, in, in terms of what we're doing, wellhead, uh, wellhead delineation zone as well. What's important for us to, to also recognize is that uh, any contamination that uh, is released within the wellhead protection zone can actually get trapped into this capture zone and potentially make its way, way into this uh, extraction well. So when we talk about what our work, what we did is we had the same concept and uh, within the MECP kind of delineation of things, they have these specific rules. So this is our entire capture zone, which is this zone over here. It's defined by the 20, 25 year travel time. So if contamination from here uh, drops into this zone, then it's essentially 25 years, and it's conservative, uh, would make its way into the well. And then we have a five-year travel time, two-year travel time, and uh, this other, it's called uh, the one meter zone, which is basically um, uh, WAPA A. So I'm going to uh, introduce some other concepts where this is WAPA A, two years is WAPA B, WAPA, WAPA C, WAPA D. And that's what's going to define. And basically, we use computer models to define this. So the first phase of it, which is really technical, and that um, and that's basically using all the uh, available information. We developed con uh, conceptual site models of the hydrogeology properties, uh, water supply wells. We created a, um, a numerical model, which is a computer model using all that information to help us understand and create those WAPAs A through, um, A through D, as I just showed you on the previous slide. We calibrated the model, developed the WAPAs for the four wells. And then the next step of phase two was looking at the vulnerability, uh, meaning what uh, if groundwater or sorry, um, contamination got into a certain area, how, how vulnerable would the municipal well be to that uh, potential source? And then we identified the threats within the, the WAPA. And that's based on, the threats are also based on uh, whether it lands in the WAPA A or through the D, because they have different time periods. So I'm going to run through Beechburg first, and then I'll get into Haley. So Beechburg um, consists of, um, as, you, as you know, a massive dug well, I think. I think all of you know. Uh, and that's, uh, that's, a, that's a real beauty. Like, you don't see too many of those uh, these days, but it, uh, it's, it's a real treasure to see something uh, so robust and, and, uh, and, and such a great water supply. The second one is, uh, is drilled deeper. It's 3.5 uh, meters uh, deep. And it's drilled into, um, not into bedrock, but into soils as well. And that's, that was drilled in about 1991. Uh, both the drill well and the dug wells can be pumped. Um, it's, on, it's on a cycle and it's basically pumped out one, once at a time. So in terms of the location, uh, Beechburg, we've got the dug well and then right beside it's the drill well. And that's, you know, you're, you're, you've got your, your facility right there as well. And I know talking to, to Lane, I think there's quite a bit of um, new work going into that, uh, that building and, and pumps, et cetera. So in terms of the, um, the aquifer and where things sit, I just wanted to kind of point this out because it, it does make a difference in terms of how the threats, et cetera, are 
uh, categorized into future, uh, future slides. So there's a little Jackson Lake. Uh, we've got a sandy aquifer right here. The, the first dug well is sitting right here within this kind of upper zone. And then the deeper drilled well is sitting within this sort of sandy gravel aquifer. And beneath all that is the um, uh, bedrock aquifers and then the deeper aquifers as well. So this cross section kind of zips right across here from A, uh, a to A prime. The outcome of our computer modeling, so I kind of skipped a whole bunch of things that uh, were very, very technical in nature, but this is really what you, you need to see, is uh, based on our conceptual site models and our computer models um, and our pumping rates associated with the dug well and the drilled well, we have uh, the wellhead protection area for beach work defined as this zone. So this is the, the whole outline of it. This is um, WAPA A, that was the one that was at the fixed radius, it's called. The next one is B, and then we've got uh, C and then D. Uh, what also complicates it, and I don't want to get too, too much in a rabbit hole right now, is that there's a, there's a WAPA E, which is based on if, it's, uh, if these wells potentially could be hydraulically connected to surface water, and then that is co called WAPA E. That does have some bearing in the future threats, but um, because of uh, recharge and, and such com coming from uh, this area, into the lake that could impact the well. But for right now, it's basically, this is the main zone of, of, uh, of the wellhead protection area. The Haley Town site area uh, is, is actually very geologically different uh, than, than Beechburg. It has two municipal wells, they're 10 meters apart. Um, they're actually in bedrock and they're, and they're actually pretty deep. Um, uh, the ministry's uh, reviewed them, has some inspections. There might be some issues with one of them, but uh, so far they, they operate very well. So in terms of Haley, we've got the one well, uh, two wells right beside each other in that smaller community as well. Uh, geologically speaking, here's the open screens of the, of the wells right here. This is their, their depths. So you can see they're very deep. You can also see that uh, we don't have much overburden um, as, as well. It's, it's a very thin veneer and, and it gets into bedrock uh, very quickly. That thin veneer uh, affects the, the threat assessment because there's no, say, clay or other materials that could uh, impede contaminant migration through it. So uh, from a threat potential, uh, this ends up being a bit higher or higher, if you will. The same with Beechburg, even though Beechburg had much more sand and, and such. Because it doesn't have any clay or such, it gets a higher um, threat potential as well. So in terms of the WAPA, Wellhead Protection Area Outcome for Haley, it, uh, it's defined as this zone around here. And there's, there's your, your A, your fixed radius. And then we have uh, B, C, and then D. And then we also have a bit of E because there's some uh, wetlands and streams, et cetera, that were, were part of that as well. So in terms of the drinking water threat, uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, there's two things. Uh, there's quantity and, and quality. And uh, you have a lot of uh, quantity, so that's not an issue for, uh, for your, your supply. So it's not like wells are going to go dry. Uh, they have lots of yield, um, but uh, our focus really was on the, the quality side and, and looking at the threats that uh, land within the, uh, the different wellhead protection zones, if you will, the A, A, through, uh, A through D. So this is a list of drinking water threats, and, and this really comes from the ministry's um, um, they, they essentially have a rule book. Um, uh, they, they modify it, uh, but 2021 was the, the last kind of version of it. So these are the drinking water threats um, that pose a risk to, to drinking water that is part of every wellhead protection study. So very common things, septics, road salt, fuel handling, any sort of chemical storage, waste disposal sites, agricultural practices, um, any sort of handling, uh, grazing, you know, it's amazing how much livestock can actually impact, um, uh, say, contamination. That's kind of how Walkerton happened. 
fertilizers, pesticides, and other other stuff um, that could be could be uh, close by or in the area. So the threats are then characterized by significant, moderate, or low, uh, and that depends on a number of different things. But there's a scoring system, and from that scoring system with the wellhead zone, then um, then an outcome is is then placed on the, the wellhead protection areas. So getting down to the, the chase a bit, um, what we found is that um, uh, for a lot of the lists, the 21 lists, it really doesn't apply. Um, there's a lot of um, things that are managed really well by the township. Uh, for example, there's no fuel storage or other things near the wellheads. So we're not seeing that, but um, we are seeing um, the impacts of, of septic systems um, within the wellhead protection areas at both locations, both Beechburg and Haley. And it's a source of E. coli and coliforms. Uh, and it's uh, within WAPA A and B. So those are the sensitive ones because they're right beside the wellhead. And uh, sampling has shown um, that the raw water sampling rather has shown that uh, uh, groundwater is impacted um, with, with uh, septic uh, coliforms, et cetera. Uh, it's being treated, um, and we'll get to this in a minute, but um, it's hard, you know, our, our, our philosophy is it's better, it's, it's better to treat the source and, and not always the symptom. So that was really um, one of our focus of this site was, uh, in these both sites, was looking at the threat assessment from, from septic fields. So just in general, uh, this is how the scoring came up for Beechburg. Uh, the, the whole area right here would be considered a vulnerable area. Uh, a lot of factors went into that, uh, including the, the capture zones, but also, uh, as I mentioned, because it has no clay or other things to impede contaminant migration into it, then it's, uh, it has a higher threat potential. And what's significant within here, again, for Beechburg, is that there's uh, 33 um, threats, um, septic system threats. And you can see them, these are these little dots right here. These are all septic systems. So we have 15 septic systems are located within A and there's 18 within B and they're all considered kind of a, a higher threat. So that's uh, a significant outcome for the study is just knowing that we've got kind of this, this rim around our, our major uh, uh, WAPA A and WAPA B, which are, are more sensitive based on travel times. The scoring threat for Haley, kind of similar, you can see that it basically encompasses the entire capture zone, uh, well, the protection zone rather. And it, uh, again, uh, the wells are positioned right in rock. And because of that, they have no, um, they have no, nothing to impede contaminant migration. If something lands here or over here, it will immediately go into the water supply. Uh, it has nothing really to impede it. Um, so much like Beechburg, um, we've got, uh, again, kind of a blow up here. Uh, this is um, wellhead protection area A, which is that 100 meters uh, radius. And then you can see around here, we also have, um, this is the, the B. And within that, we have 25 threats. Um, nine are, are in A and uh, 16 are in B. And then we have a couple of others outside of that uh, that are considered uh, moderate threats as well. So that was really the outcome of the, um, the first phase of it. So the, the outcome of it was, was simply we, we have the well protection zones, we defined them, we, we did all the threat assessment, and then we defined the threats, the significant threats within each of the, each of the zones. So now uh, the second phase of the work, which is uh, considered a separate document in our terms of reference, is we produced a source water protection plan. And the source water protection plan has um, looks at what I just described to you, all the threats within the different zones. And then it lays out a number of risk management me measures that are essentially recommended um, uh, to be considered within whatever mechanism you can bring those forward. So um, some municipalities bring them through bylaws, official plans, best practices, things like that. But it's really um, 
to some degree at the discretion of the region, how they want to handle and how they want to uh, kind of craft some of these recommendations into uh, any sort of um, enforcement, if you will, right? So we laid out a number of these and it's a separate document, like I mentioned. So this is just an example. I'm not going to go through this uh, because of the timing, uh, but here's an example of the septic system. So, you know, one of the, here's a step stepwise um, summary of the plan, locating uh, the septic fields, ensuring that they're pumped out, ensuring that there's inspections and maintenance, you know, there's diversions, you know, making sure that tanks are, are have the full integrity, um, you know, making sure there's best practices so people aren't putting down hazardous uh, chemicals. It's amazing how much uh, pharmaceuticals end up down the drain these days as well. Um, and then, you know, just anything to do with planting trees, et cetera. So these all are uh, labeled or uh, provided and labeled in our, in our discussion. And, um, and that's one of the outcomes and more significant outcome of our study. Uh, this is uh, uh, an example of our road salt one. And I wanted to mention road salt because um, it's kind of a, one of these sneaky things. Uh, and it's because uh, road salt is kind of a, we must do, and it's a common practice. We've done it for years. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, the risk tolerance for road salt is very low compared to say septic systems or landfills, uh, chemical storage. But they, they can sneak up and they can basically destroy aquifers. Um, very high chloride concentrations can make the aquifer really non-potable. And then it takes years and years to, and decades uh, for that aqu aquifer to clean up. So we've, um, with, with Lane and others, we've talked about a road salt management plan. I know there's a lot of good things happening already um, to stay away from the wellhead uh, protection areas um, and, uh, and proximal to the wells. And, and start to kind of thinking more in terms of how do we manage our road salt away from our wells so that we don't have any kind of creeping chloride concentrations over time, which um, uh, as you can, as I noted in previous uh, slides, there's not a lot of attenuation um, within the upper zones to reduce the chloride concentration. It will, it, when, it, when it lands, it, chloride is very soluble and it will get into groundwater fairly quickly. There's other uh, risk management plans that were identified within the source water protection plan, and um, they include fertilizers and pesticides, um, transportation of hazardous materials. There's some, there's some uh, larger municipalities that won't allow, um, you know, oil tankers, uh, gasoline tankers into their wellhead protection area. They just don't want to have a spill, and then it's uh, impacting and, and a disaster for their water supply. Uh, prohibited land use that includes uh, you can't have um, say a landfill close by chemical storage tank farms those types of things um, and and th those could be captured within whatever um, mechanism you have within say official plans etc and then uh, other things just to do with kind of low impact development you know there's uh, the city of Barrie which I, I do a lot of roster review they're, they're totally on groundwater. So they're really encouraging uh, like lack of dewatering, um, uh, artificial recharge, just things like that to, to maintain and maximize kind of clean water and, and available water in our system. Because the alternative to, to water, uh, aquifer water is, is not always available, uh, especially coming from major rivers and piping it in. The, um, as I mentioned, the, the phase of the work also includes um, uh, understanding and, and getting into the community with some of this information and, and how that information is uh, provided and uh, disseminated to, to different groups and, and outreach. But really, the, the message about uh, the education side is making sure that people know how to protect and manage their activities so they're not impacting the water supply uh, whether it's within the wellhead protection area or not, uh, but really kind of that wholesome, robust understanding that, you know, what we're doing uh, now uh, is affecting aquifers and water quality, and we need to make sure that there's an overall goal. Um, and there's a lot of ways of doing that. Um, uh, again, there's an 
a, a really good um, initiative at the early stage to say, hey, this is our study, this is what we're doing. It went out to a lot of folks. Uh, it went on the website, so everyone knew the study was occurring and, and the reasons why, uh, and, and that's that's awesome. And the other uh, pieces of that, if you know, kind of down a layer, if you will, is outreach with local uh, stakeholders. They could be farming associations. Uh, it could also be septic system providers or inspectors, uh, so that they know a bit more uh, kind of rules. Uh, could be uh, fuel handlers. Just kind of getting them to know what's happening. Um, and it's really about awareness. And then there could be information announcements and things like that. And in some municipalities, they also include uh, a source water protection roadside. So it's like, um, you're coming into a zone and this is our source water protection. So it's, it's just about awareness. Aquifer water is beneath us. We don't really see it. We, we take it for granted. But it's the it's the foundation of why a lot of communities are, are where they're at, and and we need to protect that. So again, it's a, it's a really good way of kind of information, and it can be subtle because people are driving by it all the time. It's like, yeah, this is my this is my protection area. I need to I need to do this. I need to be part of this. Um, so the final uh, part of this, I think I'm still on time, uh, with with some recommendations. Um, and uh, it kind of boiled down to three of them. One was a data management, and I know um, it's been done very well, but we just want to make sure that uh, it continues on, is uh, just assembling all the current information. Uh, water quality trends, uh, like I said, road salt uh, and, and chloride, sodium chloride and road salt can creep up. So it's really good to understand over time uh, if there's any issues and, and catch those early, right? Um, and then, and then if there's are, are any trends or new in any new chem chemicals that are coming up, <coughs> excuse me, um, that need to be caught, um, then it's it's caught early, um, and that's uh, a key recommendation. We also number two was hydrogeological investigations. Um, you know, like I said, it's it um, treatment at the at the source um, uh, treatment of the wellhead is is a symptom of a larger project uh, problem we would uh, recommend uh, and that's your greatest concern right now we would recommend a hydrogeological assessment uh, to look at the septic systems that might have the greatest impact on water quality and um, and then there could be a number of recommendations coming from that about uh, how those um, uh, you know kind of nasty players are, are affecting Water supply and what to be uh, what can be done with those, um, and the last part of it was just if there's any future refinements to or modifications to the system, such as uh, you know new drilled wells or new pumping rates, uh, new locations, etc. Then uh, that would kind of change the wellhead protection areas, and there would have to be um, some updates of just the um, uh, some of the study parameters and outcomes. So that is all I have. Um, I'm sorry if I rushed it. I felt uh, well, again, better, better get going, but uh, that's uh, that's what I have. And uh, 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 thank you for listening. And I'll take any questions. Excellent. Thank you so much. I I don't think you rushed it. I uh, I think okay. we were able to absorb that. It was a great presentation. I really appreciate it. What I'll do is. I notice it comes up later as an agenda item. We'll take questions now, and then if there's anything from staff, we'll do the next agenda item. Okay, perfect. So open the floor to the councillors. Any questions for our presenter? And I've missed his name, sorry, Lane. Oh, yeah. It's uh, Steve. Steve, it's, sorry, Steve. Yeah, yeah it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I got overwhelmed in our previous <laughs> agenda item, so Steve. Okay, any, <laughs> any uh, questions for Steve from the floor? Yes, Councillor Tabbert. I'm not sure if I have questions for him or more for our staff. Yep, yeah, throw it on the floor. Okay, do we yeah. have any control over our septic systems? Like, do they have to be pumped or is it just suggestions? Um, so as it currently stands, we do not have a septic reinspection program or requirements around pumping. I think what uh, Mr. Livingstone is referring to is that we could develop a framework where we'd have voluntary or mandatory, mandatory septic reinspection programs. Uh, in the cases where we develop that framework, uh, in most examples that I've reviewed in, in Ontario, 
uh, the, the municipality is funding to some degree that reinspection program where we're contributing funds to support that reinspection. And in any case where the system has failed, then we have the ability to issue orders through the Ontario Building Code uh, to have the owner fix the issues. So no now, but we do have options available to us to develop a program. Yes, please. Um, do we have a road salt management plan? I know uh, a few years ago uh, there were concerns about salt on the roads, um, and I'm wondering if we developed a plan. Thank you. Uh, currently we do not, but it is in the uh, uh, department's goal to, to, to bring one forward. Um, and maybe if Steve can provide more, the, um, the code that I reacts for the, the management plan, it, it's a, a, a um, voluntary uh, plan to have, um, but, but very good for uh, the environment and, and also the, the well protection. Last question or more? No, just on. just on this. Do we um, spread a lot of salt around our around Beachburg um, station and the Haley Town site station where the wells are? Uh, so in we do apply salt in the uh, Haley Town site, um, and we do uh, in, not as much in Beachburg, but we do put salt and then also sand mix in Beachburg. Yeah. Perfect. Any other questions, Councillor Bell? Um, general question about uh, development within these wellhead protection areas or individual builds is, uh, is uh, sorry, his name? Mr. Livingston. Mr. Livingston, do you have an opinion as far as uh, building within those wellhead protection areas, seeing as the, the, the septic systems are really the primary threat uh, to those water systems? I, I don't... I don't think there there should be restrictions on development. I think I think there, you know, through risk management measures, through very common practices, it can be managed well. And septic systems sometimes get, uh, you know, they they operate very well um, until uh, you know just over time they they can fail uh, just with lack of attention, etc. So my main answer is I don't think I was restricted. I think just a bit more kind of um, understanding or uh, putting forth risk management plans, uh, whether they be best practices or part of a building permit, et cetera, that would be uh, where I would probably land on that. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions? I just have a couple, Mr. Livingston. Um, the, the size of the W wellhead protection area Yes, WAPA or whatever. Um, is it based on? It's based on the quantity of water drawn. Yeah, out it's of the based well. On, yeah, it's based on a couple of things. So maybe I'll just. Uh, it's a really good question. Like it. Um, let me just go back to. Uh, yeah. So that. Um, the wellhead protection area that's defined here, uh, for example, its um, its main process uh, and it's influenced by how much you pump right here, uh, what type of materials you have. So if you if you have clays or sands or gravels, that will definitely change the wellhead protection area. So sands will have a larger one versus say a silt, which are smaller. And then the the third piece is time. So as you pump longer then you get uh, uh, larger capture zones as well. So the ministry has defined basically a pumping time period of 25 years. So it's geology and hydrogeology, soil types, pumping rates, pumping depths, and time. Perfect. It just, what it made me think of was our other communities, which are not serviced by municipal water, but have multiple individual wellheads. I was mm -hmm. curious about their own wellhead protection areas, but I guess it would be reflective on that all those all those um, factors including yeah. how much water they'd be drawing Good. yeah and i think on a on a uh, residential side then there's that setback so they have to any well drill or can't i think it's 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 30 meters or 50 meters from a septic field yeah they have to make sure that it's it's set back from from a septic field 
Good. Another question I had was just on open system geothermal wells. Ooh. <laughs> and and I'm I'm of the impression that these things would not be safe, especially within these designated areas. Um, can you offer any insight? Yeah, that's a really good one because the geothermal systems tend to be deep. Um, so they don't usually kind of occur kind of in the upper zone. They tend to be deeper systems because they're transferring heat from deep to shallow and then injecting back. Um, but I think, I think it would be wise on any geothermal application to look where it sits within your WAPA and see if there's any disruption of groundwater flow. I think that would be, that would be wise. Perfect. Perfect. Well, that uh, clarifies it for me. Anything from anyone else? Yes, Councillor Moore. Just in your discussion there, that brought up uh, a question in my mind. Do we currently require a building permit to install a geothermal? I will let the CAO confirm. Uh, I, I certainly don't know while I sit here, but I could uh, find the answer and, and email Council the, the response. Thanks. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Livingstone. I really appreciate the time you took and, and your patience in getting to your agenda <laughs> item. So thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate the time you invested in this. And, and we, we're going to address it again with staff here at a, at a subsequent uh, agenda item. So it will come up again for how we can address your recommendations. Okay. Thank you, Your Worship. And thank you, Council, for all your time. Really okay. appreciate it. And it's been a pleasure working with your team. Excellent. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. You too. Thank you very much. Excellent. We're on to our next agenda item, 4.4, which is draft budget for 2023, water, wastewater, and general operating and capital. So a summary will be provided by our treasurer. Over to you, Mr. Crozier. Just bear with me while I get uh, situated here um, to get it on the screen. Excellent small technical uh, challenge that was quickly fixed. Mr. Crozier, floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I, I added this uh, this presentation um, after we, we started the deliberations just because I thought it would be uh, a wise to maybe give an all-encompassing quick uh, quicker presentation than the, the past presentations on just where the, the deliberations went and how that looks as a, as a whole and then kind of touch on some of the key highlights. Uh, so as you'll see here in the timeline, um, we're on February 8th, so the next uh, meeting would be, be next week, um, and it would be where the budget bylaws are passed, after a public meeting, hopefully. Um, so it's the key highlights of where we, where we stand today. So both operating and capital together is a total tax levy increase of 8.99%. Uh, that is 4.19 of that is due to the operating component of the budget, and then 4.8 of that is due to the capital component of the budget. Um, when we began in December, staff came um, <clears throat> when seeking direction. Uh, it was recommended to have uh, an operating increase uh, in the 5% range, and then uh, capital due to the asset management plan at 4.2. Um, so throughout the, uh, the budgeting process, um, we were able to, to get operating decreased a little bit. And then at our last meeting with some capital 
uh, when we spoke about capital, obviously there's the, there's those needs. Um, so so staff are here with the total increase of 8.99 versus the total increase that was uh, in December of, of 9.2. Um, the wastewater rate increase, 12.25%, uh, and the water rate increase of 9.3. <clears throat> so some changes from the last meeting. Um, the, the building fees, so uh, we originally presented uh, the, the change in building fee to be 75 cents per square foot, uh, when in 2020 it was 60 cents. Um, we've amended it to be 69 cents per square foot. This was 60% of the proposed increase, so from 60 to 75, we took 60% of that difference, and so that's how we get to the 69 cents, and that was recommended by council. Um, and then just to reiterate the change in the calculation method, uh, which I'll speak to in a further slide, but that is different than in, in previous years. And so that net effect uh, from where we were was a $28,000 increase to the levy uh, due to the decreasing of the, the proposed fee from 75 to 69 cents. The uh, capital project, so there was considerable um, discussion over the, uh, the, the road rehabilitations uh, that were presented. Um, and we had in there Zion Line and Mansell Hill Road. Uh, the funding for those two projects was uh, in the vicinity of $485,000. So what we've done is we've, we know that we're, those are coming from it through um, grants. They're coming from OCIF, the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund, and, the, uh, and from, I believe, some of the, from the, uh, formerly the Gas Tax Canadian Community Building Fund, CCBF. Um, so anyway, we're le like that will obviously be decided, I believe, at a later date when the strategic planning process comes. But there's funding there through those programs for road rehabilitation. But you will drill down and confirm exactly what those projects are, are um, moving forward. Um, the special projects, so the Ross Garage Space Needs Study, this was originally presented as a $50,000 expenditure. Um, but basically, we we do it we drilled that down to be just over, to stay in at just over $20,000 uh, with an RFP to be issued um, in 2023 quarter two, and then award sometime after the strategic planning exercise and let the strategic planning exercise dictate how in depth you'd want to, you'd want to go with that project um, based on, on, I'm assuming what you're going to touch on is growth needs. Um, and, and whatnot. So there is a, a, a line item there to be RFP'd with that, that budgeted item of 20,000 that came down from 50. <clears throat> so just to reiterate in the building fees calculation, so in 2022, it was based on building area and footprint. Uh, so there's no fee for the basement. Um, and then the quick example is two story home with a basement uh, was charged one floor of area. In 2023, the change in the, in the calculation uh, would be based on finished floor area, a reduced rate of one third for the basement. Um, so a two story home with basement uh, charge two floors of area plus a reduced rate for the basement. So this slide got um, um, edited for, uh, this slide got edited for, for, for that change in the fee. So as you can see, where Whitewater Region would stand in comparison um, to, to some neighboring uh, municipalities, uh, Pembroke, Arm, Prior, Renfrew, and Petawawa. And I know it was brought up that to, to look at maybe some of our, our other neighboring municipalities, but in terms of uh, the time frame, and then with just, the, just sitting back and looking at the service, um, we have a, a CBO and a building inspector where some of our closer neighboring municipalities, sp specifically Horton and Admas and Bromley share a CBO. Um, so that fee there in general is, is, is much, well, would, I would assume without looking at it too in depth, um, would not be uh, apples to apples in this case. Um, so as you can see, the, the building permit fee would still, the way we're presenting it, fall um, below the Pembroke Arm Prior rent from Petawawa. So, and it also was discussed on, I think this was two meetings ago, or maybe the original meeting on, on how much of the, was relied upon the levy for building. Uh, so as you can see in 2022, the budgeted uh, shortfall. So the, the, so the shortfall there, meaning how much of the tax levy was used to cover 
uh, the, the building expenses after we factored in what we were brought in in revenue. So we're, and, and we've spoke a lot about being cost neutral or, or cost recovery or full cost recovery, sometimes you'll hear. So we moved from 47,000 to 15. So it's moving in that cost recovery direction um, based on, on the new calculation and, the, and the, fee, the new calculation method and the fee. So after the changes, just to reiterate some of the operating pressures, uh, we know that there is the, um, the, the fire training hours were significant uh, discussion. Um, based on the arenas uh, uh, budgeting to have all three uh, open for that time, um, we had the uh, increase in service with in 2022 with the building inspector and there's a few other factors in there, but with uh, some seasonal employees, there's a, the increase in the full-time equivalent of 1.2, 1 or of 1.7, and then we have the cost of living allowance for staff and uh, council. We also have uh, the option for part-time and casual employees to uh, enroll in the Omer's plan, which we're obligated to, um, which we're obligated to offer. So there's some factors in there with the, with the staffing and cost of living uh, piece. We know the utilities. We spoke in depth on those. I gave the dollar figure here on those increases. So 155, 100, so call 150,000 for fuel. Uh, the heat, heat, hydro, heat, water, and wastewater at 52,000, and then uh, 17,000 for insurance. So those are some of those operating pressures. <clears throat> so with capital and special projects. Um, we would have a $1.7 million investment in capital or transfer to reserves for future capital. So specifically speaking there on the $200,000 you'll see in vehicles, those would be contribution reserves for a, um, a road vehicle and a fire vehicle in future years. Um, $712,000 in buildings, $208,000 in equipment, $95,000 in fleet, uh, the $200,000 contribution reserves, and then $560,000 in roads. And then there'd be $148,000 investment in those special projects, which were, were those different types of studies uh, that we spoke about at the last meeting. <clears throat> so the water and wastewater rates. Uh, so I just laid out the updated rates and, and, and what water is, what wastewater is, and then combined. Um, so I won't spend significant time on, on this because we've seen these, but just to, to, for the public and to have it in another presentation, I've included it here. So water, as you can see here, the increase in revenue um, and then the, the kind of the expense piece to it, uh, the, the major or the biggest difference here would be a, the contribution to reserve and that's to offset um, some future capital items. Specifically, we know that we have the, um, the water tower, the, um, it's a project. The, water plant the water treatment plant in Beechburg uh, that we've applied for the grant. Thank you, Ivan. <clears throat> With wastewater, uh, again, you can see the increase here in revenue. Um, the, the, the main drivers of this is the contract uh, with Aqua. Um, that's an increase of roughly $70,000. And then we have the, uh, this other category that we increased from 37,700 to 79,900. Um, <clears throat> the, these are billable call hours, sewer line maintenance, which is flushing to keep the sewer flowing, and sewer line repair. So we've budgeted... Uh, for two sewer line repairs when in the past we had budgeted for one. So that other category is based off of uh, two-year averages and actuals uh, from 2022. So prudent budgeting would say um, that that needed to increase. So then what we get to, and we're almost, it's a bit quicker, I know, and I'll turn it back here in a few minutes to the chair for questions, but the question on, on how does that affect the uh, taxpayer? So I have two different, uh, two different pieces here in the next two slides. So this slide here speaks to the effect of $100,000 of assessment. And by the way, uh, uh, to clarify and, and give this uh, the statement that I need to is this is estimated. So this is my best, uh, my best um, stab, I guess, for lack of a better term at, um, because there's a lot of factors that'll come into play uh, with tax rates, but this is my best, best work here on what the residential tax rate would be, municipal residential tax rate at this current time, factoring in the 2023 assessment um, and information that I know today. So tax per $100,000 of assessment uh, in 2023 would be $708.84. And again, this is a lower tier municipal tax, so whitewater region tax, not upper tier county or not education. 
um, in 2022, that was $663.44. So that's an increase per $100,000 of assessment of $45.40. And then if we had, if we take a look at the median single family detached assessment in 2022, that was 177,000. In 2023, that's 179,000. So the lower tier municipal tax would increase to 1,269 from 1,174. And that would be an increase in lower tier municipal tax of $95. So putting this together with the water rates for, for the different types of users. So if I start on the far right, for if, you're, if a, a resident is not, and this is, a, by the, this is a median, so the median assessment in a single family detached home, uh, not on water or sewer, they would see that increase of $95 or the monthly change of $7.92. For a resident that would be in the same type of home on, uh, that's on water, their change for the year would be $187 and that would be a monthly change of $15.58. And then for a resident on water and wastewater, <clears throat> their change would be $371, which would be a monthly change of $30.95. So that's my presentation of the kind of the all encompassing of the work that's been put in to uh, get us here. Um, there'll be a, <clears throat> a more in-depth, more fulsome presentation next week for the public meeting. Uh, that would go through back, if you, if you remember back to our original meeting with debt, uh, reserves, um, <clears throat> and some of those, those pressures and a little bit more in depth, uh, and then the, 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 pub, the public would have an opportunity to, to speak at that point in time. Um, so with that, I'll pass it back to the chair if there's any questions uh, on what's been presented thus far. Thank you, Treasurer. I, I know a whole bunch of work has gone into this so far and I just, Thank you again on behalf of all the council here. The work that you've put in has got us to a great point. Um, I think we've shoveled an awful lot of onto our strategic planning exercise, uh, but that's important because it's really hard to do budgets and make plans for the future if you don't have a strategic plan. So um, that is going to be a lot of work, but it will pay off. So we'll open the floor to questions on this presentation. Councillor Tripp. Actually, I don't have a question um, because this was so well explained. I know your comments about strategic plan is important and there's going to be all kinds of questions that, there, but really um, this has answered uh, any questions I would have had uh, with respect to what, does, what can people expect approximately uh, with their bill. And um, uh, this is very clear. Uh, and um, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Olmstead. Yeah, I echo those sentiments. Thanks very much. Great presentation. Very clear. Um, two things. One is the remaining increase for the building fees. Uh, that'll be somebody else dealing with that. Do we have it noted? I, I think we agreed to implement that January 1st, 2024. Um, yes. Is that correct? Yeah, so um, just one on record, um, as it will be a new treasurer, I would suspect to be dealing with that, that um, that, that happens. Okay, um, just to be clear, we're talking specifically about the building fees. Yes. We, we decided to go 60-40, mm -hmm. 40% being next January 1st. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Sorry, yeah. second point. And second point is um, before you leave us, um, I'd like everybody to receive a copy of the schedule of reserves. Um, I don't think that'll be easy to get to, but I think you and I should probably figure that one out. My, um, I, I would, I think that you will receive not very long, hopefully after my departure, the audited financial statements, which will have those. Um, I'll make every attempt to get the reserve piece before I depart um, close. Um, but <clears throat> even if what I give you, you'll, you'll still receive um, a more accurate piece when the, the audit financial statements come on, on all the reserves. That at December 31st, 2022. So factor in those couple months of change. But yeah, we'll, we'll work to, to get, that, uh, get that to you. Just to clarify, to, uh, subsequent to that, does that line up with the strategic planning exercise? That statement of reserves, the, the final, the timing, thirty-first. Yeah. Uh, 
I don't know when you're doing the strategic planning exercise, but I would hope that the audited financial statements come sometime in um, March to April. Like I'm, I'm, my hope is, I've put some pressure on the the, uh, the auditors, but the, the plan is to get them as much information and get the year end to a certain point before I, I leave on for a couple of weeks. And then I come back for a week and there's a meeting with um, that we'll have with Ivan and the auditors to know where we're exactly where we're at. And then there'll be a better indication then on when those statements might be ready. Perfect. And that'll just be, some, that'll be a factor in our discussion. Sorry, Councillor Olmstead, did you have? And that was it. Thanks so much. Excellent. Uh, other questions? Councillor Bell. Yeah, not so much a question, but more of a comment. Thanks a lot for all your hard work. It was presentations were great easy to understand very uh, very accessible um, that one point that you had there as far as the increase for the uh, the tax levy and what that means in real dollars on uh, on people's tax bill per hundred thousand I think that's probably important for us council members just to have in the back of our heads for uh, for questioning from the public just to, because whenever you hear almost a nine percent tax increase. I think the real, uh, the real world dollars of what that means on your tax bill is a little bit easier to digest than, than the 9%. Um, so thanks for laying that out. And I think uh, I'll try to keep that the tip of my tongue for sure. Good. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Councillor Moore. Thank you, Sean, for your hard work and enjoy your holiday when you go south, real <laughs> south. Um, then I go to the clerk. Um, can we get a copy of this budget draft, please? Thank you. Just the PowerPoint presentation? Yes. Okay, good. And Councillor Tabard. The only question I have is our wastewater. Um, I noticed we put nothing in reserves. What Do you know what the total is in reserves for wastewater right now? Through you, the chair? Uh, well, I'll give you what I think it's going to be in terms of uncommitted dollars. So there's going to be a year-end balance there, but there's there's also some projects that are are multi-year that funding is going to come out of the reserve in 2023 which is pretty standard when you do major projects my assumption is there's going to be somewhere in the vicinity of 150 to i'll say two hundred fifty thousand dollars in wastewater reserve but i will say that's unaudited at this point in time that's a that's an estimated uh that's an estimated guess thank you thank you sean no final questions Excellent. Thank you again, Sean. Next item on the agenda is announcements. Um, today for the announcements, I'm going to go first. And what I'd just like to do, I prepared some notes here to keep me on track and not to go too long, um, to give some feedback to council and the public and the members of staff who didn't attend about Roma. Um, that's the Rural Ontario Municipal Association's conference that took place this past January 22nd to 24th in Toronto with over 1,500 delegates. In, uh, in attendance was myself, Councillor Trim, Councillor Tabert, and CAO Burton. It was overall an excellent conference. Uh, I will speak to some of my experiences as a group and then I'll pass it over to Councillor Trim and Tabert uh, for any additional comments. Uh, the conference has, in, in my opinion, four components that are worth presenting. First. Uh, there are main group, main programs that are offered to all the delegates at once in one large ballroom. This is where we addressed, we were addressed by the Premier and many other key ministers. There was also other speakers touching on issues applicable to everyone on a general scale. Here we learned of things like the rural housing information system uh, that can provide a potential developer in rural Ontario with information like zoning, planning for available tracts of land that could be developed. Very, very great piece of, of uh, information. Roma also spoke to housing attainability in this innovative rural housing and homelessness solutions. Uh, housing was a main topic uh, for many of the discussions. We also were able to attend two open forums where questions were answered from the floor. Uh, not a whole bunch of opportunities with 1500 people in attendance, but we got to hear answers from the first open forum from 20 different ministers. And then the second forum was a cross section of experienced municipal staff. So it was really interesting to see what questions were being asked and some of the answers. So uh, very, uh, very, very good. The second uh, portion of the conference had to do with concurrent, success, current, concurrent sessions and learning lunches. Essentially, when you're trapped 
uh, to, to listen to a, a presenter. So you attend these, they're about 90 minutes in length, um, and you get to select which ones you want to go to to see what pertains to your township or your own personal interests. Um, and very valuable in that they're presented by township staff or consultants that have actually done those things in their areas. So there's lots of great question and answer opportunities. Topics that we attended were things like short-term accommodations, the blue box transition, supporting seniors in rural communities, innovative practices to obtain, to attract and retain talented staff, and sustainable investing in water and wastewater uh, were some of the key presentations we attended. Uh, lots of takeaways. Third is the trade show. Um, this is a great way to meet with companies, ministry staff, and not-for-profits and th think tanks. It was a great way for us to trade business cards and gather great reference documents. Uh, for example, Omafra zone rep, our zone rep was present, stopped us and asked us about if we were going to apply to their rural economic grant and then encouraged us to do so and have offered up meetings that I think the CAO has got scheduled for this week. So a great opportunity there. OFATV, so the Ontario Federation of ATVs, was there and they stopped me and advocated for the continued access to the CN rail bed. Uh, they mentioned their investment in its maintenance and their contribution to our economic development. The next one, Royal, the Rural Ontario Institute was also there and they had some great inf uh, additional info on their presentation about the rural housing information system. So again, a valuable thing. The last and most interesting part of the, the conference was the delegations with different ministries. We were fortunate to meet with the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Infrastructure and we sought his advice for the investment into roads that support our significant Ottawa River tourism sector. So specifically the grant settlement kind of railway or grant settlement area. We also asked them for some advice on the use of retired rail beds for active transportation. Great conversation. We didn't have a lot of time with them, but they promised to get back with us, give us some feedback on some of our questions. A second meeting was with the Minister of Seniors and Accessibility to seek annualized funding for a Seniors Active Living Centre. Um, went very well. Uh, there's typically no commitments given in these types of delegations, but being granted the opportunity to speak with these ministers is a very positive thing for our township and, and advocacy is the first step. We asked for but were not granted an opportunity to meet with the Minister of Natural Resources to discuss the rehabilitation of the Westmeath boat launch but we're not done there. We're going to continue to try via other means. So it's not over. So overall, it was an excellent three days and uh, looking forward to how we can incorporate much of the things we learned into our next steps. So good. Councillor Trim, anything that you want to add? Oh, well, you gave uh, an excellent overview and uh, um, I did uh, attend uh, all the sessions that were, were, were given for uh, the general audience. Uh, I also attended the workshops that I had time to when we weren't uh, visiting with the uh, uh, with the ministers. Um, however, I was uh, uh, one workshop that I will highlight was the the one that you have mentioned about retention of staff, and um, it it um, was uh, brought home to me uh, that uh, we're not alone in this. Um, rural municipalities all over Ontario are experiencing what we've experienced where uh, we seem to be the training ground for um, staff to step up the ladder to um, more responsibility in bigger municipalities. And that's not uncommon and it's not necessarily a bad thing I learned in this seminar. Um, also, we heard about strategies to recruit um, uh, new staff to us. And so I, uh, uh, th th while all the sessions and workshops were of benefit to me, um, I came away with um, um, some um, better understanding of uh, staffing, retention of staffing, and uh, strategies to do that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Tavard, any comments on Roma? Yes, I, uh, I actually did what you did and I had to write something down because I was very impressed with it. It was my first one. So it says I spent two and a half days in counselor training. Uh, it was an option uh, that they provided 
by AMO. Um, there were 24 of us in attendance and it wasn't all rookies. Um, topics included what is a council member, including roles and responsibilities of each as managerial staff, the principles of municipal governments, equity, diversity and inclusion, human rights, legislative powers, responsibilities, and so much more. There was also the election of our board of directors for Roma, and I'm happy to say that Jennifer Murphy from the mayor, the mayor of Bonisher Valley, and a councillor at Renfrew County and a former warden of Renfrew County uh, was elected to the board. Um, what didn't happen at this board election was um, the election of Peter Emo and Reeve of the town of Renfrew, and our current warden who is representing Emo at the rural caucus. There is also an opportunity to hear a speech from Premier Doug Ford, Steve Clark, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, and various ministers answering questions during open forums. Uh, there were several information sessions and I attended three of them. The first one, uh, which we did briefly discuss tonight, was the short-term accommodations, um, which are not Airbnbs. These are becoming much more popular. The guest speakers, I, met, I spoke to them after, and while there is money to be made from this type of accommodation, it's not something a municipality should enter into lightly. There are many things to take into consideration, including how it affects your municipality and its residents, not just those who want short-term accommodations. Uh, solutions for healthy rural communities. Um, guest speakers were Mark Graham on mental health and addictions, care in small rural communities, Dr. Jeff Goliski, Rural Ontario Medical Program, Amanda Mongeon, who is a PH student at the University of Guelph, speaking about opportunities for rural health, and Robin Bentley speaking on investing in rural health. Supporting seniors in rural communities, the guest speakers were Noel, it doesn't matter who they were, but they spoke about NORCs, which is really kind of interesting because it's called naturally occurring retiring community. So it's not something that you build, it's something that just happens, but you do sort of recognize what's going on. Uh, Raymond Cho, the Minister of Seniors and Accessibility of Ontario, was also in attendance at this session. Uh, I did speak to him, and when I told him who I was and where I was from, he actually knew that we were meeting with him the next day. Um, I believe exciting things are coming to our municipality following the meeting with Minister Cho. It was a great opportunity to meet council members from throughout the province. While I met many, the one who stands out the best is Cheryl Fort, the mayor from Horn Payne, because not only did I find out who she was, but she promoted her town when she introduced herself as the geographical centre of Ontario. And yes, I did look it up. Is it the geographical centre? I have no idea. But I know next time I introduce myself to somebody, I'm going to have a line about Whitewater Region. And I'm sorry to say, I don't want it to be Whitewater Rafting because there's so much more here. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I'll offer the CAO. Do you have any comments you want to <coughs> offer on the uh, participation at, at Roma? Uh, I would just, just highlight uh, the opportunity to network with uh, fellow CAOs from other communities in Ontario. Um, also, uh, connecting with uh, uh, regional uh, mayors and councillors, but also the local ones. So not much opportunity to converse with mayors from Admiston, Bromley or the likes in my day to day. But at this at this conference, it's an opportunity to sit next to them during a session and just converse with them a little bit. So it's uh, just highlighting the networking and um, and the provincial presence. So it's uh, certainly a good experience for myself. Thanks. Good. Thanks, CAO. So there are a number of other conferences. We can talk offline if other councillors are interested or want any advice in terms of what might be available. Um, but if we do attend conferences, I'm hoping that um, we can take a few short minutes of our subsequent council meetings and get this kind of feedback, not just for us, but also for the public. Excellent. So back into our formal announcements. I'll just go around the table. Councillor Tavern, anything you'd like to announce? Uh, no, no, thank you. Good. Councillor Moore? Yeah, um, I've attended uh, two meetings so far at the uh, Pembroke area um, airport. Um, we did have a tour there last Friday for any council members who wanted to attend. Uh, it was a cold day, but it was well worth the trip. Um, but our previous first meeting, um, the major thing of discussion was uh, uh, the repaving of the uh, runway and in future then the runway lights. So that is ongoing and uh, we'll be hearing about more of that in the future. Thank you. Councillor Trim? Uh, yes, uh, there will be a, a big breakfast at uh, the Westmeath um, Arena Hall upstairs uh, Saturday morning. 
uh, 8 o'clock. Um, it's a fundraising for the uh, Westmeath and District Recreation Association, and everybody is welcome, and it will be delicious. Good, thank you. Councillor Olmsted. Yeah, thank you. I have two. Uh, the first one is the annual Civitan Fishing Derby in Cobden has been delayed from this Saturday, February 4th, to Saturday, February 18th. A uh, very well attended function, usually over a thousand participants. So uh, due to the ice conditions, they had to, to delay it. And that actually affected the second one. So the Foresters Falls um, Carnival was scheduled to go February 18th. And now they're going February 19th on the Sunday. But I believe on the Saturday evening, they still have a bingo in Beechburg. So uh, I think pollsters are coming out, I think today actually. So keep an eye open for that. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Bell. No points. Excellent. Uh, that finishes announcements. Next on to item six on the, on the agenda is reports. Uh, 6.1 is our statement of council remuneration. The recommendation before us is that council of the Township of Whitewater Region received the 2022 Statement of Council Renumeration prepared by the Treasurer dated 1st of February 2023. Can I get a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Olmsted, seconded by Councillor Moore. Yes, now I would ask, I turn it over to staff. Gosh, staff for comments. So Treasurer, please. Um, so just for some of the council members uh, that are, are new, so this is a uh, mandated report that I, I must do each year before March 31st. Um, this is the earliest I think I've had it, so, so that's great. Um, so basically we're just reporting to the public uh, on, on, the, on, on different types of remuneration that uh, council members receive. Um, so just for some definition purposes, honorarium, this is the amount payable uh, to the mayor, Reeve, because they were the Reeve for the majority of the year, uh, and councillors for their performance of, du on the, of duty. The benefits piece, uh, just to clarify, this is the uh, this is the CPP contributions um, and e employer health tax. This is basically the statutory contributions paid by the corporation, and then expenses um, as per bylaw uh, 1903-1161. Now, this bylaw ha did there was a bylaw in 2022 that repealed this, but for the it didn't come into effect until the new council term. Um, so anyway, expenses are, this includes allowances for miscellaneous expenses, expenses related to conferences, conventions, or any other municipal business or function, and mileage for travel. Uh, and then I broke breakout donations, as this amount is payable to local organizations. So council in the past has elected to use some of their funds that is uh, identified in that bylaw uh, for donations to local groups. So you'll just see the breakdown, and I'll note that, um, uh, for council or for for mayor, for former mayor Moore, I, I didn't know what to do on that one, so I kept them for the, what the majority of the year was. Uh, so for for Mr. Moore and for uh, uh, former councillor McLaughlin, there's the, the ORPC and ORES, so they serve on those boards, and we include that that remuneration in in this as well. Uh, so with that, I guess I'll ask if there's any questions. Thank you, Treasurer. Any questions from council? Excellent. So we'll, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor? And passed. Thank you, Treasurer. Item number 6.2, which is the wellhead protection areas. Um, recommendation before us is that the Council of Township Whitewater Region receive the Beechburg and Haley Townsite Source Water Protection Plan and WHPA delineation, groundwater vulnerability and water quality threats assessment report prepared by Geocentric Environmental Limited. Can I get a mover and a seconder, please? Moved by Councillor Moore, seconded by Councillor Trim. And I'll turn it over to our Public Works Manager for presentation, please. Yeah, thank you. I won't spend too much time on it, as we already had the, the presentation um, by Steve. By Steve. Um, the big thing is, is, is for next steps, I'll, I'll highlight, is, is the, the public education part. Um, as I look at in Steve's presentation, um, some of the items um, can be uh, um, open house um, information on a on a website about what a, a wellhead uh, protection area and, and what you can do, um, and just uh, and just moving forward with just uh, public education, um, and then that that will close out the project. Um, one of the additional 
uh, changes might have in the future with our, our Beechburg uh, water plant uh, upgrade, uh, de depending on what happened with the, the dug well, um, there might be an amendment to it, but not uh, uh, drastic. Thank you. Good. The only comment I'll make before I open questions is just the maps that were provided by the contractor. Um, can they be overlaid on something that we're more familiar with? Uh, like the planning map or the one that usually is presented for severances or consents? Yeah, what we'll do is um, we could certainly provide the digital mapping to the county. So in our official plan schedules, we could include that, that area. And also with our zoning bylaws, we could include a delineation uh, around those areas, yes. That's perfect. Thank you. And open to the floor for questions from Council. Councillor Moore. Um, they gave reference tonight to uh, two wells, and, and you yourself gave a reference to the dug well. I thought there were three wells at one time, but right now we're only dealing with two? There's only two. Okay. And you made reference to that dug well. It's going to be investigated for further use. Is that what the investigation is for? Uh, part of the Beechburg uh, uh, project that we're doing right now, um, that we're in full swing of right now, uh, the the dug well will be investigated for other uh, uh, to be to rehabbed or to be uh, uh, decommissioned and, and a, a new drilled well be in place. And what's the time frame for that? Somewhere in this upcoming project? That's correct. So 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 part one is the, the engineering part of it that that we're doing right now. Um, then once that's uh, uh, completed, we'll move into the the uh, construction of it. Okay, so hopefully we'll know in time for next budget, if need be. It is, yeah. We should and, have an answer by then. Yes, and in and, and this budget, the, the project is funded, our, our portion of the, yeah. Okay, thank you. Good, any other questions? No, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Motion's passed. Excellent. Item seven on the agenda is notices of motion. Any notices of motion from council? Oh, did I miss one? 6.3. Yeah. It was added. Oh, yeah, I'm working off an old one. Okay, sorry. <laughs> it's a point of order, Council Mayor. Thank you. No, we got to keep on track. Um, according to the agenda, we've got item 6.3, which is a pay and benefits policy. The recommendation before us is that the Council of Township of Whitewater Region approve an amendment to Schedule E of the bylaw number 21-07-1404, pay and benefits policy. Can I get a mover and a seconder, please? Moved by Councillor Olmsted, seconded by Councillor Tabbert. And I will turn it over to the CAO. Yeah, thanks so much. So in the agenda that was published on Monday, we had the amendments, the amended bylaws part of the bylaw section of the agenda. And we've added this report to explain the changes uh, for the members of council and the public. Um, attached to this report is a summary of the changes, but the fulsome policy is attached to the bylaw later in your agenda if you scroll down. But essentially uh, what we have before us is back in July, 2021, uh, the Township Council uh, with the former CAO had adopted this, what we call the human resource policies. Uh, so it's a consolidation of all our human resource policies and those were presented at a very high level to the members of council during our orientation training. Uh, one of those policies is the pay and benefits policy. It speaks primarily to the compensation and benefits of, of the employees of the corporation. Um, as a result of some organizational change, so the CAO departed and then our HR compensation coordinator left as well this past fall. Um, the policies uh, were reviewed by the current staff and one of the items uh, that was being, I guess, misimplemented, uh, we corrected that with staff. So uh, what it is is that uh, during the year, you're allowed to accumulate time in lieu over time as time in lieu 
uh, for vaca for off, so so bank time as we would call it for another term. So uh, a time off in lieu of overtime worked. Um, as the policy reads today, uh, a staff person is only allowed to have one week or five working days in the bank throughout the year. So uh, what happens with that is certain staff uh, work a lot of overtime in certain parts of the year. So for example, a recreation staff will use a lot of, um, may have to use more overtime at, in the fall. And then it's, it's basically they would like to try to accumulate that uh, over, they'd like to accumulate a bit more time so that they could use it uh, a more fulsome, like uh, a longer period of time. An example would be, uh, sorry, it's extremely hard to explain. The summary is there, but uh, uh, basically they're allowed to accrue one week and have one week, use a couple days, and then accrue, fill those days back up. The proposed change here would be they'd be permitted to accrue two weeks and then use those two weeks of bank time at a later time in the year. That's the summary of the, of, of the change. Um, so that's with respect to the non-management, non-supervisory employees. For the management and supervisory employees, uh, the maximum, maximum accumulation uh, is to not exceed 15 working days. Um, so for, for employees that are not management, it'd be 10 working days. For, for supervisory, it'd be 15 working days. And then the other little change is item six you have on your screen here. Uh, so that in the event where there's a declared provincial or township state of emergency in a calendar year, the managers would be permitted to accrue a third week. So how managers work, we we don't, we essentially get overtime at straight time. We do not get overtime at time and a half, which the employees do. Um, we're only permitted to accrue two weeks in a, in a calendar year. After we've banked two weeks, the overtime we put in, there's no, we don't receive any compensation for that. So the, um, the changes here, would provide a benefit for the managers, but also provide a benefit for the, super, the non-supervisory staff. So there's a, a benefit to both, both sets of employees, if you will. I'll be glad to answer any questions. If there are any. <laughs> it's all there, and I tried to clarify it. And Thanks. Thank you, CEO. And this is also um, in, some, in the spirit of what we see at county level. That's correct, yes. Yeah. Excellent, so we'll open the floor to questions. Any comments, questions from council? Councilor Olmstead. Very well explained, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, very clear to me, actually. Uh, I did take time to read it. Um, so I, I, I'd agree with the proposed changes, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Olmstead. Councillor Bell. Sorry, did you say that you don't get, so you're allowed to accumulate as, a, as, sta as management staff, you're allowed to accumulate so much in, in bank time and then you're not compensated at all? Yeah, so that's, that's correct. So um, generally speaking in municipal corporations where you sit in a supervisory or management role, um, it, it's been my experience with the municipalities where I've worked is that management and supervisory staff are generally uh, based on their pay compensation only allowed to accumulate two weeks of, of, of overtime at straight time, not time and a half, and after that, you're not compensated for any additional overtime you put in. Whereas the employee who's non-supervisory, they could, they will first, they accumulate overtime at time and a half. They're allowed to bank, based on the changes, two weeks in a calendar year. And after they bank the two weeks, they get paid out. So any additional hours over their 80 or 70, depending on what division you're in, you'd be paid out at time and a half. Good, Councillor Bell. So just one other question. Um, is there any point in time where, when that bank time, when a, when a worker utilizes their bank time and takes a week off, let's say in July, is there any point in time where you're calling in people on overtime to basically replace an individual booking off with their their in lieu of time, if that makes sense? I, I would say generally not. Um, so the scheduling of your time off in lieu or vacation is approved by your supervisor and we would anticipate that that employee would ensure that he's not having to call people in 
during that those periods of time. Yeah, that's correct. It's a good point, and it would if that was happening, that would be a first indicator where they'd come back and say we need to hire more people, because it would probably at some point it'll be cheaper to employ someone at straight time than overtime. We've got more hours of work than people available. Yeah, I just I asked that question because I know uh, in one specific municipality anyway that where if an individual is called in, uh, if somebody books off using their time and a half in lieu of, and an overtime individual has to be called in, that that time in lieu of gets charged at time and a half as opposed to the time. So I was just wondering how that, oh, but that's not always the case. It's, Thank you for that, Councillor Bell, good perspective. Any other questions for staff? Good, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Motion's carried, thank you. Uh, item number seven, notice of motion. Looking around, nothing on this side. Notice of motion, okay, none seen. So item number eight, adoptions and minutes. Yeah, Councillor. About a motion. Um, Councillor Tavert mentions a motion about kennel bylaws. Yes. Is that something that's going to be on the docket for not February 8th, but February 15th? Is that. There's two notices of motions that are in the queue. Okay. Both weren't um, tabled tonight. They will be tabled at the next uh, regular council meeting. Fair enough. 15th, I believe. Okay. That's right. Councillor Trim and Councillor Tavert. They're just reviewing the wording and it'll come forward. Good. So. To be clear, no additional ones. Excellent. Item number eight is the adoption of minutes. 8.1 uh, re uh, recommendation is that Council Township White Water Region approve the regular and closed session minutes of January 18th, 2023, understanding that the closed session minutes remain confidential. Can I get a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Bell, Councillor Trim. Any questions, comments, revisions to those minutes? Okay, and I just have to check with the clerk. There was one revision mentioned on email. Okay, so the version that's in front of council right now has been updated. Excellent, good. Then I will call for a vote. All those in favor? And it's carried, thank you. <coughs> Item number nine, correspondence. Uh, the first one is uh, Infrastructure Canada's Active Transportation Fund, essentially a grant application. I'll turn it over to the CAO if he wants to make comment. Yes, with respect to the infrastructure, the uh, the correspondence, I'll tr pass that over to Lane, if you will, uh, Lane, for the uh, for summary of that. Essentially, we've applied for an active transportation grant, and we were unsuccessful. Maybe you could speak to the pr the proposed project real quickly. Uh, yeah. so, it's been a while. Sorry. Um, we uh, yeah we, in April, I believe it was April 20, uh, 2022, uh, we applied for a funding grant um, for the. Um, there's two parts, one with bike racks, and the second one was for um, the, car, the Cobden Marsh Trail and, and linking to the beach property, um, basically from Forster Falls all the way to the, to the beach. Um, we, this is the second time we applied for the, uh, for, for the application, um, and, and just for, for the project, and, and uh, both times we've been um, unsuccessful. Perfect. Can I just... Uh, and I at some point, can I get the dollar figure that we applied for? Do you remember it off the top of your head? I do not, but I, I can email uh, okay. uh, council with it. Perfect. The next item for correspondence is 9.2, Eastern Ontario Region and Network. Um, I can speak to this one. It's the EORN newsletter from December 2022. Now, EORN, just to review for those listeners, is essentially the organization that's serving the municipalities in Eastern Ontario, trying to upgrade our cell reception and our high-speed internet. Each of the townships contribute, and in our case, the county of Renfrew contributes to fund this, essentially, organization that, that supports us. They were the ones that were successful in obtaining um, extensions of high-speed internet to a number of locations a number of years ago, but they've also been successful in working the provincial and federal governments to secure cell phone towers across the municipality. And I can't remember the exact number. Does anybody recollect that number? I think it's six, CAO? It's five towers in the Whitewater region. Five towers. These towers have already been, their locations have already been approved by council. 
In fact, you, they were doing ecological studies on a number of those locations this past summer. Um, the reason that brought it forward for a correspondence was just to make sure that the public was aware that that's still ongoing, it's still in process, and they're projecting by 2025 that we'll have all these cell towers implemented. So that would take our cell reception in Whitewater Region up to 99% across the township. So patience, it's in progress, and EORN is on top of it. And we have a county councillor who's a rep on the EON board. EORN board. Uh, councillor Trim, you got a question? I appreciate that uh, when they're all anticipated to be constructed and in um, operation. However, do you have any idea when they might start? Because that's the question I've been getting from people who have signed contracts uh, for, the, for their property. And um, they wish now they had looked a little closer at the fine print. Mm -hmm. And so is there... You know, if something could even start in our municipality, understanding that it will take some time to put up five of these towers, uh, could, can you, through the county rep, get any information for us about that? Yeah, great question, and, and I did. So uh, the challenge is, is they were going to a closed meeting about that detail. So she can't share the specifics yet. She knows that I'm looking for it. As soon as it's releasable, it'll be provided to us and we'll be able to share it with the public. Good, Councillor Tabert. Um, I was over in the Westmeath area today and I noticed there's a tower on Lookout Road. Uh, do we know if that's cell or, or um, internet or? It's Whitewater internet. So I'll get the CAO just to confirm because he's. Yeah, so Whitewater it. Internet, which is a local based internet company, uh, they've been installing towers throughout the, the township. So at the same time as the Roger, Rogers Communication was applying for these site plans, they had done the same thing for numerous properties in the community. So that would have been a tower from, from Whitewater Internet. Perfect. Again, just to demonstrate we're monitoring this, please keep the questions coming and, and we will corner our council rep to make sure. Um, that we get the answers specific to what Township Whitewater Region. Good, the last item is uh, 9.3. Uh, City of Pembroke has requested a letter of support for a new area aquatic fitness and community center. Essentially, uh, they need to replace the center that they have in Pembroke and they're looking for our non-committing, non-financially committed support. Uh, so basically, they're, they wanna make an application for funding and would like us to voice our opinion on whether or not we support it. CAO, is there anything you want to add to that? No, just that uh, there's a draft response letter to the to the piece of correspondence. So if there's no changes uh, and uh, uh, no opposition, then uh, we'll have it signed by the mayor and, and returned back to the city of Pembroke. Thanks. Good. So if there's any feedback, please let us know. Uh, before we move on to item number 10, uh, according to the the bylaws I have to ask uh, for an extension to our meeting. So can I get a, a motion from the floor to extend our meeting? Until what time? Until 8.15. 8.15? Yeah, sure. yeah. 8 so 8.15, Councillor Moore, you'll move that motion? I'll move that motion. Thank you, and a seconder, Councillor Trim. All those in favor? Yes, motion is passed. You get to stay an extra 30 minutes longer. <clears throat> Thank you. Item number 10, bylaws. I'm working off this old version, okay. February 1st, uh, 2023, we have three, two bylaws listed. A recommendation that be it resolved that the bylaws listed on the February 1st, 2023 agenda be taken as read and passed. Can I get a mover and a seconder? Councillor Olmsted, Councillor Tabert. Any comments, questions? Call for a vote, all those in favor? And carried. Good, item number 11 is closed session. Uh, we have a closed session agenda item today on active transportation land purchase. The recommendation before us is that the Ta Council of Township of Whitewater Region move into closed session at 7.46 p.m. as permitted under section nine of procedural bylaw to discuss a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board with staff participating in the meeting to discuss active transportation land purchase. A mover and a seconder, please. 
Councillor Trim, Councillor Bell. All those in favour? Good, and it's passed. We'll move into closed session.